I'll go ahead and call this meeting to order. Uh, good evening and welcome to the May meeting of the Knox County Commission. Uh, tonight's meeting is the uh, work session meeting. I also want to uh, make it clear that we are meeting in accordance with uh, Governor Bill Lee's Executive Order 16, which was actually uh, recently extended till the uh, end of June. Hopefully we won't need it in June, but that uh, executive order was extended till the end of June, which allows municipal bodies to meet electronically while we're uh, trying to uh, tamp down the uh, COVID uh, spread throughout the state and the country. So uh, with that said, I'll go ahead and uh, call the meeting to order and ask the, uh, the county clerk to call roll. After that, for those who may be uh, tuning in from home, I'll kind of give a, a brief overview of kind of how the meetings work or, and if, if this is your uh, your first meeting. So, uh, Madam Clerk, would you please call roll? Commissioner Gill? Present. Commissioner Carringer? Present. Commissioner Smith? Here. Commissioner Nystrom? Here. Commissioner Schoonmaker? Here. Commissioner Anders? Here. Commissioner Bussler? Here. Commissioner Beeler? Here. Commissioner Daly? Here. Commissioner Jay? Here. Commissioner Biggs? Present. All members are present. Okay, very good. Okay, uh, Commissioner Gill, would you mind uh, leading us in the uh, Pledge of Allegiance? Let's try that again. I pledge, oh, allegiance, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, be seated. Thank you, Commissioner Gill. You're welcome. Uh, for those of you who this uh, may be your first meeting, uh, just to give a really big picture, or for, excuse me, first time maybe watching a, a county commission meeting, uh, and this is something that we we always say, even when we're not doing it via the Zoom meeting, is uh, every month the county commission has two specific meetings. The uh, first meeting of the month is a work session where we take the first pass through the agenda. Uh, many items will get uh, initial debate or discussion uh, or analysis during the uh, the during this work session. Uh, you'll also notice that uh, some items may we may vote on tonight and they could pass or be put on what's called a consent agenda. And the purpose of building a consent agenda is so that next week at the, uh, excuse me, on Tuesday at the main commission meeting, many of those items that are on the consent agenda will be passed with one, partic one vote at a time. So you don't have to have a uh, roll call vote, frankly, on every single item. Uh, so next week's meeting is the, uh, the meeting that counts, all the votes are uh, are the are the ones that are the uh, the votes that count next week. This, as it said, this is a work session to do the uh, first pass through the agenda. So now, uh, another thing I might add uh, at the beginning before I uh, call on Mayor Jacobs, you know, uh, the way I've looked at these meetings and you know trying to you know, you know take advantage of Zoom and the governor's order to make sure we're not all sitting next to each other or, or, or potentially put, passing any bugs, but. You know, should we get uh, you know changed to move into phase two? It's my plan to do my uh, best to move us safely into uh, in-person meetings uh, upon uh, moving into uh, phase two on the county and the city's uh, plan. So, um, you know, with that said, the uh, the we are now moving on to uh, public forum, and the uh, as I mentioned in the forum, uh, I've asked Mayor Jacobs to uh, have a moment to address the uh, commission. So, uh, Mayor Jacobs, uh, you're uh, you are uh, you're officially called. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As far as an update on COVID-19, uh, since last meeting, uh, the numbers are trending in the right direction. Uh, I'd like to can thank the Knox County Health Department for the great work that they're doing, uh, both with testing um, as as well as working with businesses um, to uh, implement the Phase One plan and also they continue to work with hospitals and healthcare providers and really 
be a hub not only for uh, information, but uh, just overall in coordinating the response for COVID-19. Uh, but again, we've been extremely fortunate. Our numbers are trending downward. As of today, we have zero hospitalizations. Um, the number, we did see uh, a, a slight increase in the number of cases last week. That was mainly due to a couple of worksite clusters, um, but now the cases have uh, dropped um, pretty significantly. And again, zero hospitalizations. And thankfully we have remained at five deaths for almost three weeks now. Um, every death of course is tragic, but we have uh, fared much better than many other places has. Um, you know, as we turn our attention um, to the other impacts of COVID-19, do think it's important that when we look at the economic impact, uh, we still have businesses now that have been allowed to open, but many of them only at half capacity. Uh, some still are not open, and of course, they all have uh, some significant restrictions and uh, been forced to deliver services in alternative ways, uh, which is causing, as we can all imagine, uh, disruptions not only to their businesses, but also to the people that work there and to the people they serve. Um, so with that in mind, as you all know, last week uh, the governor announced that uh, the state and the State Department of Health was moving a little faster and uh, ahead of schedule on easing some of their restrictions. Um, and I would like to read a letter that I wrote uh, to the Joint Task Force for the city and the county in that regard. Um, so the text of the letter reads, Dear Joint Task Force members, as you know, last week, Governor Lee announced the state will issue new guidance, effective May 22nd, to large attractions such as theaters, theme parks, and museums, and will further ease restrictions on restaurants and retail. I strongly urge you to follow the state's lead moving forward and support issuing similar guides for Knox County beginning Friday. The purpose of COVID-19 mitigation efforts was to prevent hospitals from being overwhelmed by the pandemic. Thanks to the efforts of our community and our healthcare professionals, we have kept that from happening. Knox County has done what it's been asked of. I understand the desire to exercise extreme caution before making changes, but available information indicates it is safe to further loosen restrictions, just as Governor Lee and the State Department of Health are doing in 89 other Tennessee counties. Knox County is reporting some of the lowest pandemic numbers in the state, and there is no certainty that staying closed as other counties in our region open will offer any protection from community, from community spread. As the virus runs its natural course, we must remain, uh, excuse me, we must absolutely remain cautious, but also realize that nothing we do is going to stop it out completely. The danger now is that we are unjustifiably delaying the process of healing our economy, which is itself a danger to public health. A sick economy will undoubtedly also produce sick people. Too many of our neighbors remain without work and too many businesses continue to struggle to keep their doors open even after implementing alternative business models. Delay and easing these restrictions puts Knox County businesses at a competitive disadvantage to those in neighboring communities, harming not only the businesses themselves, but also the people they employ. How can we say our shutdown was to protect the health of our residents when we can't restrict their freedom to cross county lines and to patronize businesses which are not subject to the restrictions we have placed on our own? When we look at Knox County's number of active cases, hospitalizations, and fatalities, they indicate no good reason to continue enforcing this shutdown. For this end, I believe that the Health Department's reopening task force should follow Governor, Governor Lee's lead rather than wait another week. Sincerely, Glenn James, not having that. Uh, for specific information about COVID testing um, and the numbers that the Health Department is seeing, I believe that Dr. Buchanan is on this call as well. She can supply that information. Uh, and that is all I have. Thank you. All right, uh, thank you, uh, Mayor Jacobs. Uh, the chair recognizes Commissioner Jay. Mr. Jay, can you hear me? You're, 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 you had your hand up there, so. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this is a, a question for either Dr. Buchanan or the mayor, whoever would like to take it, but. Can you tell us when the task force's next uh, plans to meet and what was the current plan for uh, reviewing the current phase that we're in and the next phase, making an announcement about the next phase? What was that? Wh where was that to date? 
So I, I this is Dr. Buchanan. Um, I can I can take that. So um, I believe the task force meets um, tomorrow, um, and our plan is to release some information uh, later this week, probably on Thursday. Um, probably not all the details, but some announcement about um, possibly about who who will be able to open in phase two. Um, and so that's where we are with that. Um, we are right now just really looking at the, look, reviewing the data, reviewing the, the guidance uh, that's out there to allow uh, businesses and other things to open safely. And, and you know, um, looking at our numbers now, if they stay this way, we'll certainly be able to move through the phases as we planned. Um, and so that's where we are, but the task force meets tomorrow. Okay, thank you for that information. Just one follow-up is the, does the announcement from the governor or the, does it come with any data or does it come with any suggestions for, are they suggesting essentially skipping phase two and three altogether or can you help decipher what the state is looking at versus how that, I know where uh, the state's different from the county, but if you could sort of translate what they're heading towards versus what we have in place and what's the difference? Um, you know, I. I honestly, I'm not sure I can say what the difference is not having um, a lot of um, detail about how they're making those decisions. I know that they're putting out uh, regular data and um, I know that the governor is looking at data from across the state. Um, I don't think they had any set time frame for their, um, their phases. Um, and I don't, honestly, I'm not even totally clear on how many phases they're planning on having. Um, I haven't found that in the uh, reopening document or any other the documents that I've looked at. Okay. Um, thank you, Dr. Buchanan. Um, uh, Mayor, just a quick follow-up. In your letter, perhaps I didn't hear it, but I'm just curious, does, are you suggesting that we go sort of right to phase three or to eliminate phase two and three altogether and no, just finish um, out once? I mean, help me understand that a little bit. No, currently, so currently um, the state would be moving um, with restaurants and retail. Uh, we're doing what they're doing on May 20th. Uh, they're doing that on May 22nd, as well as opening um, some of the large uh, attractions. So my suggestion is just to move the date that we're looking at um, up to the 22nd as opposed to keeping restaurants where they're at now at, at, at half capacity. Okay, thank you for the clarification. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yep, thank you. All right. Thank you, Commissioner Jay. Uh, next is Commissioner Schoonmaker. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, this afternoon, uh, the commissioners got an email about three o'clock from one of the constituents in uh, my district and uh, the frustration level is, uh, is amazing. Um, the governor is going to go ahead and allow restaurants to go to full 100% capacity. But in our county, where we're having wedding venues and people are trying to get married uh, in June and July of this year, we're restricting that. And, and these are people that actually know each other and yet they, they have a, a different set of guidelines just because it's a wedding venue. You can have a, a venue that a, holds a thousand people, but according to our rules, we can't, we can't maintain, we can't even get anywhere close to that. And the problem is, you know, Loudoun County, Blunt County, Anderson County, all the surrounding counties are not restricting it as much as we are in Knox County. So I'd like to know, and the public would like to know from the health department, what kind of, you know, are we going to just on um, phase two, when are those things going to be announced and, and what's going on? Because people have got to make plans. If relatives are coming in for out of town for a wedding, they need to be able to secure airline flights and, and hotel reservations. But we got to do something and we need, we need somebody to come forward and explain exactly what's going on now. Um, like I said, uh, Commissioner Schumacher, up. Chair, if it's okay, may I take this? Okay, okay. Um, we'll be in, making an announcement on Thursday uh, with some information about phase two. Um, and, you know, I, uh, the distinction between uh, a restaurant and a, an event venue um, is that 
the event venues are places you go to gather and socialize. Their restaurants are not places you go to gather and socialize. You don't go around, well, some of you do when you're running for office, but usually you don't go around shaking hands and greeting everyone else at the other tables in the restaurants. The restaurants need to maintain, will have to continue to maintain social distancing guidelines. Um, the limit to um, gathering gatherings continues to be uh, 50, I believe, by the state guidance as well. So, um, you know, there are some limitations on restaurants. Uh, they can, there's no capacity, there's no, uh, they have to maintain the, the six feet apart uh, piece with their table. So that will limit the number of people that can actually be in the restaurant. Um, so it's, it's, it, some of it gets down to what the intent of going to that place is. And um, the reason we've waited on some of those things is because of the risk, um, the behaviors that happen there are higher risk behaviors than the behaviors that happen when you take out food or if you sit at a table with people that you know, um, limiting that to six people and you're not, you're not going around greeting everyone in the restaurant. So that makes a difference. So we're looking at the data, we're looking at how COVID-19 is transmitted and using that information to inform the guidance that will be coming out soon. I anticipate the full guidance to be coming out um, early next week, if not sooner. Okay, and you're going to make some kind of an announcement on Thursday. Um, yeah, at the our, you know, we have a regular daily press briefing. Okay. Um, that's what we've been using to make announcements. Um, so we'll be using that. Okay. Well, I hope that you and the committee realize how frustrating this is for the citizens of Knox County, particularly on these events like weddings and funerals and everything. Uh, we're very Thank sensitive you. to that. Absolutely, it's a challenging time. All right. Uh, thank you, Dr. Buchanan. Uh, let's see, uh, Commissioner Bussler, I, I was about to call on you uh, because I know you had proposed a discussion item earlier that was related to COVID and hospitals. Uh, so I'm going to call you right now because your, your blue hand is up, but also this might be a good time if we want to, if you had some questions or if we had some additional discussion related to this, um, you, you're on. Please unmute. Commissioner Butts. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and, and Dr. Buchanan. There's some things about that we have to use for, you know, for being, you know, a little bit more human when we're doing this pandemic. And what I mean by that is I've had a case here in some other cases has arisen where an elderly person has been at home and has fallen. Uh, their child comes by, which is also more uh, you know, not just a child, but say 30 or 40 year old child of this person that's 82 years old. And they found their parent laying there or was in pain and they took them to the emergency room. And the main thing that they did is they tested them right away for COVID. They tested negative and they went on in and found out that they had to do surgery. Now, the only person that they would let come into that hospital was the man's wife who was 76 years old, which is in the high risk Part. The daughter wanted to come in, but they wouldn't let her come in by some guidelines that are done by the hospitals. And humanity wise, it would have been better to let the daughter be there and the mother go home. But the thing of it is, they put the, the husband in there, like I say, is an 82 year old guy that had some, some problems, like a little bit of dementia. And he got mixed up, but his daughter wanted to go in and sit with her father, not her mother, because her mother is at a high risk. Now, we finally got that person in the hospital, the daughter in there to sit with the father. But it was like pulling teeth to get in there. We've got to have some kind of rules when somebody does not have COVID that gets uh, injured, that their family can be with them. And also, when you mentioned funerals like that too, when you have a funeral and you want to pay respects to that individual and you're a family member, you should be a little less restrictive on that type of uh, visitation. And I know this is a highly contagious uh, disease we're dealing with, but we've got to have some humanity somewhere to take care of some of these issues, especially the elderly ones that are being affected by this. 
And uh, later on, I want to talk about uh, the opening up of religious gatherings too, and how we can do that because we have a wide range of ages in a religious church where you have from the very young to the very old. And how can we do that and make sure that we can get together and worship together like we're guaranteed by our constitution. And um, we've got to have some sort of common sense in how we do these things. And um, I just wonder how we're going to address those issues also. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Buchanan, if you want to uh, take on Commissioner Bessler's questions. Oh, I guess, um, Commissioner Bessler, can you tell me what your questions are? Oh, the question is, I just didn't if, catch a, it. if an elderly person comes in, that uh, has fallen and you know has a hip problem like this 82 year old gentleman had this is a true issue that's happened he was immediately separated and tested for the virus uh they would not let the wife go back with him on back into the hospital even though she said that she wanted to be tested but she was 76 years of age too so she's highly susceptible to this and that at the high risk end of it so the daughter wanted to substitute to go in there and the rules at the hospital said that they wouldn't let the daughter go in in place of the mother. Now. So the, those, the, the guidance that the hospital is using is developed by the, uh, are, those are all developed by the hospitals. I, um, and so. Um, I understand that. And I. But it's not, when you're okay. separating people from other people to try to give that care, that's something else. And. I don't know how we're going to address that. We've got to have a, some sort of means to say these people shouldn't be separated. Well, my, my suggestion to you is, oh, I don't know which facility it was, but I would reach out to their administrative folks who are making those decisions and voice your concerns to them. Um, as they're the ones who are making those decisions, um, I, we don't have any oversight of that um, and how that gets enforced sometimes depends on the person who's on duty at the time. Um, the, the, the restrictions on visitation are really about protecting people in the hospital from somebody who might have COVID coming in and introducing it to them because they are higher risk because they're, they're already in the hospital. So um, I would suggest that you have your friend or you reach out to the hospital administrator um, at that particular facility. Um, your voice is gonna be meaning, more meaningful to them than mine about this issue when it comes to citizens and uh, customers not being happy with with the service that they're providing um, well, but those those are in place for a reason well i understand the reason being is and there's also even in this one facility that i was talking about there was almost a floor of uh, bedrooms that are not being used because they're opening they have a lot of beds opening surely the hospitals can put one section for covid and another section for you know what we call regular patients. Um, and, certainly and, that's called cohorting and sometimes they do that. Um, however, um, people also have COVID and have a heart attack or people also have COVID and have a fractured hip. So that doesn't always work that way. So um, they follow the standard procedures for isolation and, and protecting uh, patients. Um, and somebody could go into the hospital and not have COVID and be incubating and get sick while they're there. So. It's not as easy as just putting them here and putting them there. Um, and I guess you, there were, and so what was your other question? There was something about churches. Churches are being, uh, the plans for churches are being written by the state. The governor has explicitly said that local uh, health departments do not have the authority to write any rules or make any recommendations related to places of worship. So that that's guidance is coming from the state. Um, and we don't have any ability to change that or alter that at the county level uh, regarding uh, hot, uh, places of worship. Okay, <clears throat> what I had on the first part about the elderly gentlemen and, and separating them from their families is that they're immediately tested when they go in whether they have the virus or not. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Okay. Then the family member said, I would like to be tested so I can go in and they said, that's not the rule. The, the first person that they could go in there was like the wife, which is elderly right. also. And again, I really, you're gonna get a lot more traction going to that hospital administrator. 
Um, I, did go, I did go to the administrator okay. and they said the rules were here and this is what the rules were set up. But anyway, I got them in there in another way. Okay. Uh, some other people in there, but there's people out there that go through this frustration and we've got to work with them some way of have some humanity in our reactions to these people that are not, are going to the hospital other than for the COVID virus. And I don't know how you do that. I don't know what the rules and regulations are. And I know everybody's worried about getting sued now. And uh, there's got to be something that we could start here that we can protect these people that need that help. But anyway, I'll just let it end at that and I'll try to take care of it a different way. Thank you for listening. Okay. Right. Thank you, Commissioner Bussler. Uh, Commissioner Gill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, this question is for Dr. Buchanan. Have we begun to look at how to address the school systems and the um, uh, plan to roll out for um, the coming term in August or September? It's a great question for the schools. I think they're probably on the call um, that, that I don't know where they are in their planning. Um, and so that's a great question for the schools. Okay, uh, so if someone from schools wants to respond to that, uh, thank you for the question, Commissioner Gill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, this is Bob. Uh, we've got several of our staff members here and uh, members of the commission. We are looking at several different options right now. Of course, the hope is that we open up and uh, we go to school like we've always done. However, we know that may not be a possibility. So, uh, of course, on your agenda today is uh, we're looking at purchasing uh, technology, putting a, a, a laptop or a device in each of our children's hands so that we can uh, uh, move towards online instruction if, if, uh, if it's a situation where we can't go back to school. So we're looking in, at several different scenarios, whether or not we can come back for, for a, like a, an A-B day, for example, like where kids might come on a Monday, Wednesday, and every other Friday, and then a Tuesday, Thursday, every other Friday would be a scenario. Um, we don't know. We haven't gotten a whole lot of direction yet from the State Department because I guess uh, uh, we're trying to close out this year, obviously, but we are making plans uh, and looking at different scenarios for opening up in the fall. So I don't know if you have further questions about that or not, but we, we're trying to take everything into consideration right now. I have one follow-up question, which probably has um, some uh, clarification from the law director, because if we return to school, does the county bears the liability if people contract COVID-19 or what is our procedural standpoint um, regarding that? And I know this is uncharted territory, but I, I just, I, I, I think, I'm not sure if we have actually asked the question. I just simply like to um, begin the discussion centered around. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Law Director. You're on. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> well, right now, uh, we are currently under a suit related, related to, to COVID-19. And uh, I'm sure there will be plenty more. Uh, being sued is one thing, and being liable is something that the courts will have to decide. Uh, as long as we follow the policy of the state, we have a great chance for immunity. It's when we follow our discretion that we run into liability problems. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Gill, thank is that you. gonna clarify? Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Law Director. Uh, Commissioner Biggs. Thank you, Chairman, I appreciate that. Uh, just real quick, I just wanted to play off of what Commissioner Bustle was saying. He uh, was talking about the hospitals and things of that nature. Today, uh, Covenant Health released a visitation policy and hopefully it's a thing that we're gonna see trending in the right direction. It states that inpatients may have two designated visitors during their time of stay, uh, one visitor at a time. All visitors are gonna be screened for COVID-19 symptoms and they want people to bring a mask to wear at their um, destination, which is the hospital, whenever they get there. And they want them to limit their travel inside the hospital to the cafeteria and vending machines. So hopefully Commissioner Bustler, I understand your frustration, but if Covenant Health is coming out with something like that, then maybe we're gonna see the other hospitals in our area do the same. So thanks. 
Uh, thank you, Commissioner Biggs. Glad you're on it. Uh, are, are you good, Commissioner Biggs? Anything else? Yes, sir. I was trying to figure out how to lower my hand. Uh, Commissioner, Commissioner Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I have a, a question for Dr. Buchanan, but first I want a clarification from the law director. When he said we're currently involved in one COBA suit, is that a suit where somebody's suing us because they contracted COVID-19 or is it a suit by a business owner for not being able to be open? It's a class action. It's a class action suit uh, with restrictions that, are, that the, they perceive the county has put upon them. Okay, uh, I think Commissioner, Commissioner Gill was worried more about the liability of kids going back and contracting the disease. Uh, so you, I, and I think you did answer that. As long as we're following state guidelines, uh, we are uh, have a certain amount of immunity from that. Uh, but from what I understand, uh, we have our own guidelines because we have our own health department. Uh, Dr. Buchanan. I have a question for you, ma'am. Yes, sir. We, we have done, we, we, we've been at half capacity in restaurants for, it's almost two weeks now, is that correct? We're starting our third week, yes. Okay, and I know that we have went to, we, our, our testing has really ramped up. I know uh, Evelyn Gill's been a big participant in that, and there's a lot of places that we've done a lot of testing. Have, have, have most of these tests that we've done We've got results, have we not? We have. Okay, and there has not been a significant uh, uptake or uptick in the number of cases, correct? There hasn't been. Okay, but all, all these testing, I, I keep hearing four or 500 here and there and there. And there. What is our turn time now on testing? Um, I believe it's about 2.6 days or something like that. I mean, it's, it's two to three days. So if, if, we were to have a, a surge, we are in much better shape now to detect it earlier than we were say a month, two months ago? Absolutely, yes. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Sure. Okay, Commissioner Carringer, I see your, your regular hand up. Uh, yeah, thank you, Chairman. Yeah, this is um, just a little bit on what Commissioner Bussler and uh, Commissioner Biggs was talking about and um, just to reemphasize that what um, Dr. Buchanan was telling from our health department, the hospitals had their own, I guess, say task force that all got together when all this happened and they all made the rules that all of them would abide by the same rules. Um, and up until last week, no one was allowed, not even husband or wife or no one was allowed to be in the hospital because the way with this um, Corona virus is that you have to assume that everybody is contagious right now because of uh, people testing positive for it and not having any symptoms like uh, Perry Pratt who owns Pratt's Country Store in Fountain City. His wife, Kelly, uh, was very sick and has been very sick and is still sick, but getting better. Perry never had any symptoms. So, you know, who's to say he may have given it to her instead of her giving it to him. That's the strange thing. When you have the flu, you get tested for the flu. You usually know you've got some kind of symptom, but we've got people that have, or that have this COVID-19 and there's no symptoms. So um, just like last Thursday, I think the hospital started allowing one visitor um, because we've had several uh, friends and all whose uh, parents have been in and didn't get to have a visit from anybody. And um, a, a gentleman who fell was paralyzed uh, out of state and his family was not ever, I mean, not able to even visit him for over a month until just this past weekend. So, and Justin is right, it's not just Covenant, and I, I'm pretty sure whoever you were talking about probably did not come to University of Tennessee, but I do know that they've all opened that up and they are going to start, but that doesn't mean that one can come in for 30 minutes and another visitor come in for 30 minutes. So, um, 
being very uh, tough and I'm, and these hospitals do, or UT had two floors just for COVID uh, patients where they weren't mixing the patients. So uh, anyway, it's uh, something that nobody was prepared for. Uh, it's been very serious and um, everybody's learned a lot from it. And, and um, I'm praying that we don't have another wave come through this fall, but I'm pretty sure that um, everybody has learned on this and, and hopefully um, Knox County, our state and the whole US will be better prepared if something like that happens. So thank you, Dr. Buchanan and, and all of your work and, uh, and thank you to all, all the hospitals trying to keep everybody just safe as they can, even though it was tough. Uh, for everybody, because trust me, they love to have a visitor to be there with their patients because they don't, everybody can't, nurses and all can't be in their rooms all the time. So it's just been a very tough trying time and uh, we understand and I want you to know the hospital administrations and the physicians and nurses understand how hard it's been on the families because it's been very hard on them um, with family members not being able to be there to comfort their patients. All right. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Carringer. Uh, Commissioner Smith, you, your light is still on, but I've got a quick uh, question for Dr. Buchanan. I'll, I'll try to be really brief and really pragmatic on this question, uh, Dr. Buchanan. You know, as we start to uh, transition to opening things up just a little bit more, are you aware of our, any of our local businesses or local single site employers? Uh, and many of them, I know that you know, through your team, there's a lot of public options that people have been taking advantage of. And I recently saw a story about how Tennessee is actually in some ways leading the country in terms of providing free tests to people who want it, need it, et cetera. But are, are you seeing any use of say the private labs and employers kind of hiring people just to do, you know, on-site screening? Is that a, a trend that we're starting to see? Um, and are you aware of it? And also, if uh, larger employers wanted to do that, are, are they reaching out to the chamber who, who might have a network of providers on that? I, I guess for the uh, larger single site employers that might have say more than 10 people, you know, uh, you know, I'm just curious kind of what you're, what you're hearing or what you're aware of. Thank um, you. Uh, to be completely honest, my staff probably knows more about that than I do. Um, you know, we, I am aware that employers are considering testing um, large employers can certainly do that on their own. Um, and, you know, we, what I've generally done, if, if an employer reaches out to us, I've tried to connect them with a lab that I'm aware of, or even maybe a provider who might be willing to partner with them to do that. Um, you know, and, and so the other thing that employers certainly could do is, is if they have uh, uh, a health provider for their, for their employees, they could do that testing for them as well. So uh, there's lots of options for those for-profit folks. You know, our, our goal is really to test the community. And I know those employees live in the community, um, but um, hoping that some of the employers will step up and do that as well. Okay, interesting. Uh, I'll reach out. I'm not seeing any other uh, hands raised on this. And I, I know we've put this as, as I said in the commissioner's forum that I wanted to keep you know, for the time being all of our, our things related to the pandemic at the top of each, each uh, agenda. Uh, are there any other questions or uh, comments? Uh, yeah, go, go ahead, Commissioner Carringer. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Yes, this was for uh, Dr. Buchanan. Um, I realize, I mean, now that there is the antibody test um, that people can be tested for, uh, would you let uh, the rest of the commission and maybe anybody that's listening know exactly uh, about that and where they might can be tested? Because the, the good thing, the good thing about this one is, is that if you have had COVID-19, uh, you can go and be tested and they can actually take the, your plasma to help maybe um, help someone else who comes down with it. So I just uh, wondered if you might could uh, give us an update on anything about that that you might know. So, yeah, so you're talking kind of about two different things. Um, yes, there are uh, folks locally who are looking at um, uh, uh, convalescent plasma and using that uh, to help protect folks. Um, that's very experimental and very early. Uh, so those studies are being done. Um, and then there are the antibody tests that are available um, at some providers. Antibody tests for COVID-19 are not yet ready for uh, diagnostic purposes, 
they're being used by the CDC for what they would call uh, community surveillance. So that's looking across the community to assess disease burden um, and things like that. They're not, they're not for your doctor to tell you if you had it or didn't have it or give you any guidance on your immunity because we're not quite sure how long the immunity to COVID-19 lasts once you get over it. Um, so um, uh, the antibody tests have to be interpreted with, with a uh, skeptical eye um, and really aren't used to for diagnostic purposes yet. They may get to the point where they're useful for diagnosis, but they can miss a positive um, because it takes time to produce the antibodies. Um, so then you get a, a false a false negative and you really have the disease. Um, and again, really can't tell you much about immunity. They mostly can tell you if you've been exposed. If it's positive, you've been exposed. When you had the disease, nobody knows whether you have immunity and how long that lasts, we don't have that information either. So they're of limited use at this time. Um, hopefully they'll become more useful as time goes on. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, seeing no other questions, we're gonna go ahead and move on with uh, our agenda. Uh, thank you, Dr. Buchanan. Thank you, Mayor Jacobs for uh, addressing commission on this. Uh, we're now at the part of the agenda where, oh, excuse me, yes, Commissioner Smith. I'm just wondering if we need to uh, vote to accept the uh, uh, Governor Lee's order to hold our meeting this way. I'll look to the uh, law director. Uh, Mr. Law Director, do we need to vote to uh, accept a meeting in this mechanism? I'm not, I can't recall if we've done that at every meeting or not. Mr. Law Director, if you're talking, uh, there's a uh, I didn't hear your question, Chairman. Okay, uh, my question was actually relaying the question from Commissioner uh, Smith. Mm -hmm. uh, Commissioner Smith had asked uh, if, for your, your opinion if we needed to vote to uh, conduct the meeting via the mechanism provided by the governor's executive order 16, which was extended. Do you need to vote to conduct the meeting? Electronically. Uh, no, he gives you that option, and, and the chairman has the option of, of uh, conducting a meeting. Uh, I'll move on from that then, because I'm know, not sure I, that... I think you have the, the uh, discretion uh, under your the... rules, you call the meetings, and under the state's rule to us, we can go one of two formats, and he didn't give the legislative body any uh, guidance as to whether they vote on it or not. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. Well, we'll, we'll move on. Uh, Commissioner Smith, I think uh, I've been in, in meetings that have done, gone it both ways. And I don't think we've actually, looking back at our commission meetings, I don't recall if we've actually voted to conduct a meeting uh, the last two months electronically. I think we've just kind of charged on and acknowledged at the beginning of the meeting, the governor's executive order. So uh, with that said, uh, we're now at the point on our agenda where we actually need to set the agenda. So if you've got a pen handy, I'm going to go over the uh, the ads, withdraw, deferrals, and the uh, non-consent. Uh, if there's one that I missed, please uh, just let me know. Or if there's one that has not even come up that you'd like to have pulled. Uh, there are three specific uh, ones that we need to add, and that's item or agenda item 51, 53. And then there's one that we don't have a number for yet, and that was resolution R-205-909, which was to accept the uh, hand sanitizer from KTOM. So uh, that one would, that is lacking a number since it was a, it just got to us. Upon it being added, we will place that one on the uh, consent agenda. Uh, item number 41 was a withdraw. Uh, moving down into the deferrals, we've got uh, Item 54, which was to be deferred to July. I believe that was uh, Commissioner Beeler's item on um, uh, littering. Then item 10, item 58, and item 30. Those were our deferrals. And I'll look out and see if we've got any additional deferrals before I move into the non-consent. Uh, Commissioner Smith, your hand is, all right. Uh, Commissioner Schoonmaker. Yes, I have a question about number 41, the withdrawal. Uh, it was my recollection that uh, this item was going to be deferred 
because uh, uh, Commissioner Anders had requested that, that this item be deferred until we can meet face to face. So did the rules committee meet and decide to withdraw this from the agenda or, or how did we get to this point? All right, uh, thank I'm gonna move on, Commissioner Jay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, it, in order for it to be changed because it was set in such a way, it would have to go back to the rules committee because it was a matter of what order were things in. And so instead of, we, we haven't conducted the rules committee and we don't have one on the books right now because of the limited meeting. So uh, it's excellent to come back to the suggested changes. I think from Commissioner Smith, it would have to go back to the rules committee and then come back up. So I just uh, asked for it to be withdrawn until we could reconvene the rules committee and bring it back in proper order. Okay, so we, Commissioner Smith made some changes to that is what you're saying? I he suggested we no. He suggested that it be changed in a particular order, but in order to, since it was already in form and in agenda, in order to do that, I couldn't just make that change. I'd had to go back to the rules committee, make the change, get it approved, and send it back up uh, per the law department. So we have not had that meeting, and so there's no reason to keep it on here right now. So I just asked for it to be withdrawn until we could meet again. Okay, okay, because because I thought we had it in format and it was just that we wanted to meet in person so the public could give us their uh, thoughts directly. I think to that us. was also a concern from Commissioner Anders that he suggested that we wait until we can meet in person. But when I talked to the law department about keeping it on, it, essentially until we get it in the right format, which has to come out of the rules committee, we can't have we can't have a discussion about it anyway. So okay, um, okay. It, it's. Okay. It's a little bit of the parliamentary uh, spaghetti okay. junction, but in order to do it properly, we're going to have to re re reconvene the rules committee, get it back out of proper form. So it likely will come to you all in, you know, maybe July or August. And then okay. by that point, hopefully we're all in the same room and we can have a bigger discussion. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. All right. Thank you. And uh, Commissioner Smith. You're shaking your head. Uh, all right, you're gone. All right, Commissioner Schoonmaker, yeah, if you could take turn off your, your hand. All right, very good. So that was the withdrawal, which we've clarified. Thank you for uh, the, the question on that, John. I'm gonna go back and, and review what I've just said. The deferrals, uh, item 54, item 10, item 58, and item 30 were all deferrals. The non-consent items, uh, item 18, item 23, item 34, 35, 42, 47, 48, 49, 50, 51, 52, 58, 55, 56. Were there uh, any, okay, I'll uh, Commissioner Jay. You said 58, which you just said was deferred. So uh, that would not be a non-consent. Uh, you're, you're correct. All right, so we'll move that on. Let me make sure I got that down right. Yeah, I think I wrote that one just down in the wrong piece of paper there. Yeah, yeah, that one is a deferral. That was the, that's a zoning item for Mr. Monday. He wants to do that one face-to-face. Thank you. Was there also that. something on the forum about item number six? Uh, item six is going to be on consent, but Amanda Rowcliffe is going to be the person he'll be appointed to the library board. Thank you. Yep. All right. Chairman, you also had 55 not on consent. That was Commissioner Bessler's discussion on hospital. Uh, yeah, I'll, uh, we had pulled that from consent, but I'm going to look to Commissioner Buster. I think, uh, Commissioner Buster, we sort of moved that one up to the top of the agenda so that we can cover that at the very beginning. Uh, is that the way I understand it, it looked like we discussed that pretty efficiently at, at the very beginning? Yes, uh, that was what was mentioned. That's why I mentioned it before, so yeah. we could take care of it. Yeah, exactly. Okay, thank you. All right. Okay, Commissioner Schoonmaker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd like to pull uh, agenda item number 38, and this way uh, Chris Caldwell could give us a uh, opportunity to update us on this uh, procedure policy. Very good. All right. 
I'll go ahead and restate all these. Sorry if I skip around a wee bit, but our non-consent items, once again, were 18, 23, 34, 35, 38, 42, 47, 48, 49, 50, 51, 52, 55, 56. Uh, I've got another thing. We've, we're just at the point where we have got our uh, agenda for the meeting set tonight. I'll take you back last month to last month's meeting. If y'all recall, we knew that these meetings were going to take a lot longer because of the, the process of doing all of the roll call votes, you know, and, and all that piece. And we knew every meeting would probably last a whole lot longer. Uh, at that, our last month's meeting, we decided that in order to do the public hearing, in case members of the public didn't want to wait until late at night uh, to be more efficient, that we would have that public hearing briefly during a intermission of our commission meeting at six o'clock tonight. Uh, that's in about five minutes. So while we can begin to move forward uh, with our with our agenda, I want to advise you all that at um, five at about six o'clock we will uh, take a brief recess to convey the um, public hearing. I'm not aware if anybody's expressed any interest in weighing in on that particular item, but I would like to make sure we get the hearing done. See if there's any interest, and I'm going to. Have, I asked Drusilla to weigh in. Uh, we haven't gotten any emails, any phone calls or anything like that. And then also Zach, Zach I, I think this is a meeting that this hearing we can kind of do right now while we're in this. I don't know if uh, I ought to check. I don't think that was that if that was a separate Zoom or not. I don't want to close out this Zoom and then have to come back to it. Uh, so Zach, if you could weigh in on that and Drusilla, could you weigh in if we've had anybody weigh in on the, the, the want to talk about this uh, parking change? I have not received uh, any emails or calls that I'm aware of, and I had texted Sharon, and Sharon has not received any calls or emails or anything regarding uh, signing up for public hearing or any of that sort. Okay. Um, and we did publish this meeting at six o'clock or immediately after the work session, just to let you know. Okay, so we really we have had no no one expressed an interest in weighing in on this one. Hey, no. Zach, if you're there, uh, just from an operational perspective, I yeah, I've been so busy staring at this agenda. Did we set that up? Uh, that hearing up as a separate Zoom, or is that to be conducted yeah, as part correct. of this one? It's correct. It's a separate meeting. It would be uh, like like uh, Drew said. It was set at the conclusion or six o'clock. Okay. Well, let's do this then. We'll have that at the end of this meeting because operationally, I can't imagine uh, having to close this this Zoom account out and then go back into it. So, if there's anybody in the public who wants to weigh in on that uh, pop parking ordinance, and you're watching us right now, uh, please tune in a little bit later. Uh, yes, Drusilla. Um, I was just noticing on the agenda, you did not mention number 53. I know that's an added item, but you did not list it as non-consent. I didn't know if you meant to put that on consent or not. 53, that, that, well, that's a discussion item. So uh, yeah, that should not be on consent. Yeah, thank you for catching that. That is something we've added and that is a discussion item. So thank you. All right. Seeing no other changes, we will need, uh, I'm looking, I don't see any hands raised, blue or, or otherwise. Uh, we need to have a uh, vote to set the agenda. Could I have a uh, motion in a second, please? Motion to set the agenda. Okay, okay. we have a uh, motion from Commissioner Beeler and a second from Commissioner Carringer. Uh, Kim, could you please do a roll call vote? Commissioner Gill. Commissioner Gill? Yes. Commissioner Gill votes aye. Commissioner Carringer? Aye. Commissioner Carringer votes aye. Commissioner Smith? Yes. Commissioner Smith votes aye. Commissioner Nystrom? Aye. Commissioner Nystrom votes aye. Commissioner Schoonmaker? Aye. Commissioner Schoonmaker votes aye. Commissioner Anders? Aye. Commissioner Anders votes aye. Commissioner Bussler? Aye. Commissioner Bussler votes aye. Commissioner Beeler? Aye. Commissioner Beeler votes aye. Commissioner Daly? Aye. Commissioner Daly votes aye. Commissioner J. Aye. Commissioner J votes aye. Commissioner Biggs. Aye. Commissioner Biggs votes aye. All members present voting aye. All right. Thank you. That passes. Uh, next item on our agenda is approval of minutes at a previous meeting. If I could have a motion, please. So uh, moved. From Commissioner uh, moved. Daly. And it was the second. Commissioner so Gill. moved. Commissioner Gill was the second. Okay. All right. Uh, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Commissioner Carringer? 
Aye. Present. Commissioner, K Commissioner Carringer votes aye. Commissioner Smith? Yes. Commissioner Smith votes aye. Commissioner Nystrom? Aye. Commissioner Nystrom votes aye. Commissioner Schoenmaker? Aye. Commissioner Schoenmaker votes aye. Commissioner Anders? Aye. Commissioner Anders votes aye. Commissioner Bussler? Aye. Commissioner Bussler votes aye. Commissioner Beeler? Aye. Commissioner Beeler votes aye. Commissioner Daly? Aye. Commissioner Daly votes aye. Commissioner Jay? Aye. Commissioner Jay votes aye. Commissioner Biggs? Aye. Commissioner Biggs votes aye. Commissioner Gill? Yes. Commissioner Gill votes aye. All members present voting aye. All right. Thank you. And uh, Madam Clerk, next item on our, the agenda, please. The next item will be Item eight. number 18, resolution 212. It is approving the Knox County Schools 1 1 student device deployment plan for grades K through 12 for the 2021 2020 through 2021 school year. All right, thank you. Could I have a, a motion on this item, please? Uh, motion to approve. All right, we have a motion to approve from Commissioner Anders and a second from Commissioner Biggs. Okay. Uh, now I see we've got a, a several questions on that. So the motion is on the floor for approval and uh, commit in order, I have Commissioner uh, Smith followed by Commissioner Gill. Uh, go ahead, Commissioner Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, is Sup Superintendent uh, Thomas? Yes, sir. Uh, yes, I was looking at this and I haven't got all the details, but uh, uh, I, I was wondering, I noticed that parents could buy insurance. I'm wondering who's gonna be responsible for lost or damaged equipment. And are we going to be sending these things home with kids to have to bring back uh, the next day? What happens, will we have an inventory in case they forget to bring it back the next day? Uh, I'm kind of worried about the maintenance cost of this, of this issue. Uh, thank you, uh, Commissioner. It, yes, it, it's it's probably going to be end up being a principal decision, school decision in terms of take home uh, and bring back um, the thirty dollars that we're we're looking at in terms of repairs will um, help us to make the repairs. We'll make those internally. Of course, if the laptop is destroyed, then the parent would be responsible for the cost of that. If it's a situation where it's it's destroyed. So we, we probably, uh, if a child forgets to bring their laptop, I know we'll, the school will have, uh, uh, potentially would have uh, maybe a loaner that I guess we could make for the child. So this is, this, this is a work in progress for us. So, uh, but, but we've done some one-to-one -one, uh, deployment over the last few years and, and actually uh, it's worked very well. I uh, know this is on a much larger scale than what we've done before, but we had, we've had several schools on one-to-one -one. Uh, uh, deployment. So um, it's going to be, a, like I say, a work in progress, but uh, uh, it'll be a school decision uh, in terms of at home uh, for students and, and again, parents will be responsible for total loss. Okay. Um, we have different socioeconomic uh, people who would have the, some would have the ability if their student was to drop one of these in a puddle or, and we have others that wouldn't. Have we looked at a system-wide insurance policy on this equipment? Uh, we have, have not, I don't believe. We've got uh, we have several staff members here, so if I speak incorrectly, <laughs> well, I'm gonna ask one of our other folks to jump in, but we have not looked at a system-wide uh, insurance policy. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. Madam Vice Chair, do you want to take over? Yeah, that's what I was looking. It looks to me like it's his is frozen up. Okay, so Randy, Commissioner Smith, did you get all your answers? Yes, Vice Chair. Thank you. Okay, it looks like we go to Commissioner Gill. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Um, my question was regarding the cost associated with the computers for the school system. And I know we're getting um, monies from the CARES Act to cover the cost of this, 
but this becomes a reoccurring expense after the initial purchase of this after the first year. How do we anticipate covering the cost of it um, in the following or preceding years? Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, and, you're, and you're right, the initial uh, funding for this will be through the CARES Act. We expect to receive somewhere between 12.8, 12.9. Uh, million dollars, so we would utilize seven, roughly seven million dollars for the purchase and support the first year. Um, in terms of years, subsequent years after that, that will have to be, it will be a recurring cost uh, to the general purpose budget. So, um, you know, again, we'll have to make that, make that sacrifice from a budget standpoint. But I just don't think we can, we can afford not to go to online instruction based on what happened uh, the spring with COVID-19. We were in a situation where uh, our students could not be introduced to new learning. It's, it's, it's hard, hard to hear, to hear you. It's breaking up. It's, 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 it's breaking up. We, we, I can't understand what you're saying. Let me, let me try again. Is that any better? Is that any better? Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah. And I'm, let me just start back. We're, we are slated to receive about 12.8 to 12.9. A million dollars through the CARES Act. Uh, we would utilize about $7 million uh, of that to enter into uh, this lease agreement. You are correct that it would be a recurring cost. Uh, once this funding, uh, we utilize this funding, then it would it would be up to the general purpose budget to, to fund this on an ongoing basis. So we would have to build that into, into our budget each year um, in order to fund it. But I think it's something we have to do because of the situation we found ourselves in the spring where we were not able to introduce new learning to our students and if it's a situation where we're not in school being able to provide uh, that online uh, uh, instruction for students so so to answer your question it will be a reoccurring uh, expense in our general purpose budget uh, after this year and i don't know mr mcpherson is here if i can uh, shed a little bit more light on that uh, Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, yeah, I, and so Mr. Thomas is correct. I would, I would, in in many ways, liken it to 10, 11, 12 years ago during the uh, recession. Uh, we received federal dollars. Uh, it was part of what they called ERA, American Recovery Relief Act, I believe. And so those dollars were essentially used to buy time. We at that time were able to save uh, over 100 teaching positions two years in a row. Uh, as the economy slowly bounced back. Once that happened, then the sustainable structure of that funding was there. So our hope and expectation would be that a similar type scenario would happen uh, this time as well. Uh, I can say that most anything uh, in our general purpose budget is recurring. So, um, you know, it, it, it's one of these things that there's just, it, this is true, this is one-time money, um, but I, I think we would, we would be struggling to identify a one-time cost uh, that this would, this would slot under uh, that would fit um, the parameters within uh, the CARES Act, the requirements for the use of those dollars. I hope that that's helpful. That, that is helpful, thank you. But here's my concern. How do you address the digital divide in homes of children when we want to move to an online learning format and um, the, we have frozen the, um, the personnel budget in the school system. We use the CARE Act to provide this technology. There are homes that don't have access to it, yet we're moving to an online format. That the, the, I mean, there seems to be some disconnect in that. No, is that I, no, I think that's I think that's a fair question, uh, and that's okay. something that 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 we have to, have to consider. And okay, and, and, but we have Russ Oaks here, our chief operating officer, who may can shed a little bit of light on on where we are in that stage. Okay, uh, I don't know how much light it is, but well, <laughs> uh, we. We're not, I wouldn't say that we are moving to an online format. We need to have the ability to provide uh, remote uh, instruction. Mm -hmm. But uh, we do know that there's a digital divide and that there is an access issue in uh, at parts of our county, either uh, because uh, the, the service is not provided or uh, 
the service is too expensive for some folks. So we're working uh, with uh, a couple of uh, organizations around the county uh, to identify solutions to that and how to expand uh, broadband access uh, across our county and uh, Wi-Fi access as well. And uh, you know, we anticipate being able to uh, you know, find some ways to address that over the coming weeks. And uh, just uh, so you're aware, the uh, local internet service providers are involved uh, in those conversations as well. And uh, I think they are gonna wind up being part of the solution as we work our way through this. Uh, thank you. And my final question is, do, do we have a um, stakeholders committee meeting of um, parents and teachers and families throughout the county um, to look at some of the concerns coming for the school system in the fall? We have talked about forming that. We've, we've been doing that mostly internally at this point. Uh, however, I'm aware that uh, Governor Haslam uh, has, has a task force at, uh, looking at ways the community can, uh, can uh, help the school system with reopening. So uh, we've had a meeting uh, uh, there, but also we're looking at possibly involving some other stakeholders uh, in this process as we work through it um, here in the coming weeks. And can we get that information of who's on those committees? Because I serve a district that has a large percentage of uh, students that have broadband um, um, challenges, as well as families that are faced with uh, the, the closure and the greatest impact of this closure in the community in which I serve. So I just want to make sure we have people on these committees making those decisions that impact the, the community that um, is in greatest need. Because at this point, uh, aside from the information on the school board and just hearing some conversations in the community, um, I, we are, I'm not aware that the committee or the school system has met uh, within a short amount of time, June, July, and August, three months to look at including those voices at the table. Thank you. Yes, let me, let me say too, Commissioner, I uh, know the chamber, there's a task force. I'll have to get you the names. Uh, I know we're represented on that. Uh, on that task force looking at, as uh, Russ was talking about in terms of the internet access. So um, I know that's one group that's uh, that's already met several times and, and working on some things. So I'll get that information for you. Great, thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Commissioner Gill. Uh, next, Commissioner Carringer. Oh, I thought Commissioner Jay was in front of me. I'm showing it over here on my, it's easy, it's logged up the moment you put up your blue hand in the, uh, in the Zoom. So uh, we can, uh, although yours is, yeah, go ahead, Michelle, and then, okay. then Commissioner Jay. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, this, this question was, um, when, when do we think that you, you get the Chromebooks and all, when do you think that you would have them up and running and do you think that you're gonna to have to hire more IT people to keep up the maintenance and to have your help desk? I mean, if students are using them at home and they, they run into an issue, uh, is there gonna be certain times that they could call and ask or is it gonna be you know 24 seven help desk or, or how is that also gonna be? I can tell you, that, and this is Russ, uh, some of those issues we still have to work through and, and put the details on. Uh, we anticipate, or, or certainly our goal, is to have uh, the Chromebooks on hand and available for students before the 10th of August. And uh, that's easy to say at this point because we haven't put in the requisition yet. We've been uh, talking to Dell and uh, we've uh, given them a heads up that this is coming and we'll follow up on it with uh, you know, subsequent to the uh, commission's vote and the mayor's uh, signature as, as the board's already approved it. But once, uh, once we have those in place, then we can, uh, can go ahead and uh, confirm our order with Dell. And uh, it's uh, roughly 40,000 units is uh, what we're talking about uh, initially. And uh, those will come in ready to issue. Uh, we won't have to do a thing with them other than to get them logged into our inventory system and uh, get them to the schools 
uh, for uh, issue to students. As far as support is concerned, at this point, we're not looking at adding any additional personnel uh, to uh, uh, provide technical support for these uh, pieces of equipment. As, as you know, we already have about two thirds of the, uh, this number available to us that, uh, that we've been supporting. It's not that we wouldn't want to add uh, additional personnel for support, but right now I think uh, our finances uh, prohibit it and it's something that we'll have to look at over time. The good thing for us about these uh, Chromebooks is their inexpensive uh, nature and uh, they're very easy to uh, have some extra books on hand and swap out as uh, students have issues uh, with those. And then uh, your question on the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, help desk is uh, one that we still have to resolve internally and how we're gonna address that. Yeah, well, I mean, cause I'm gonna be voting to, to go along with having the one-to-one -one because it, that, that's what concerns me is making sure that they're up and running by the time school starts in August in case we have this come through again, which I pray and hope we don't, but um, we have to be ready for that when school starts back or if it gets to start back on time so that if in case we have to do this distance learning because we can't, um, it, it's so critical to make sure that our students don't miss uh, any more um, time uh, with learning. So that's why I wanted to check. I'm gonna, you know, um, I hope that we can move this along very quickly and it all is working if we're gonna spend this uh, money on it to where it's happening and it's ready to go when school is ready to open or whatever decision has to be made on that. Okay, all right, thank you, Commissioner uh, Carringer. Uh, Commissioner Jay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I still haven't heard the answer of what are the costs beyond the initial purchases annually that you estimate? That's my first question. Uh, yes, uh, Commissioner, uh, this is Ron. Uh, so this would be a three year lease. Um, it's a three, it's a $15 million uh, three year lease. So it's $5 million uh, and an annual lease payment uh, with roughly $2 million in support. So it's a $7 million investment for the first three years. Uh, these devices have an expected life of uh, five years. So, um, uh, you know, beyond that, obviously in years four and five, uh, we believe, you know, that would presumably be a considerable amount of budgetary savings. What we would probably do though would be, and it's still a long ways off, but what we would probably do at that point would be to uh, come up with a funding strategy such that we could recognize budgetary savings, but we could begin to kind of smooth those payments out such that when the devices would be replaced, we would, uh, you know, have an available revenue stream already programmed into the budget, but likely less than, than the $7 million. Okay. You also mentioned that you're um, expected to receive, tw or the superintendent expected to receive $12.8 million in the CARES Act. Uh, this proposal is for $7 million. Can you help us understand where the other $5.8 million will go? Yes, uh, Commissioner. So uh, there's going to have to be uh, some dollars that we'll fund, uh, private, that we'll have to allocate to private schools in the charter. Uh, we're still trying to narrow that down. Uh, our estimate at this point is about a million dollars that could go one, a, a little bit one way or the other. So that gives us a net of about 11.8 with the seven million dollars with CARES, then then that gets us to a net of about four point eight at that point. What what we are um, the strategy that we're seriously looking at at this point is potentially using those dollars um, to essentially fund some of the twenty twenty obligations that we are incurring now to help cover the uh, likely shortage in sales tax revenue. Um, the, the reason we feel we need to do that is is we are probably going to be in a position for the upcoming budget to uh, have to replenish uh, some dollars that we're going to utilize in fund balance uh, in order to meet that 3% state requirement. 
So if we can use those dollars uh, to essentially retroactively fund what sales tax uh, shortages could not fund, that puts us in a stronger position as we enter the 2021 budget. It puts less of a strain on it because the amount that we would have to make up through replenishing fund balance would be significantly reduced. And does the CARES Act allow you to use funding, one-time funding like this for fund balance replenishment? Well, we wouldn't, certainly we wouldn't label it as fund balance replenishment. What we would, what we would label it as would be funding existing initiatives, um, like existing expenditures. So it would in effect replenish fund balance, but otherwise if we don't use it for existing obligations, uh, then that will be an amount that we would have to reduce out of the FY21 budget and replenish it that way. So it's, it's essentially as broad as it is long, and in, in that would be the effect of it if we could go back and retroactively apply it towards 2020 obligations, and we believe we can do that. We have okay. had conversations with the state, uh, you know, with that. So, you know, it's much like the era dollars. You know, we... Um, <laughs> you, Certainly, what that the era dollars allowed us not to have to cut into the budget back 10, 12 years ago. And so, uh, you know, this would be the most, in our opinion, would be the most strategic way to do that rather than to simply find an additional $4 million worth of initiatives um, with one time dollars. I mean, we don't, I just don't think that would be a, a you know, a strong financial position to be in. Just to be, to, uh, final question, just to be clear. It, it was stated that you don't expect to need any additional headcount funding or IT support to, to go beyond the initial purchase. You can absorb that within your current staff and current operations. Is that correct for the next three years? That's certainly the plan for the upcoming year. Uh, I, Russ is, is, we, is here. We didn't say we didn't need any. We said it, at this point in time, we're going to uh, try to work with what we've got, uh, given our uh, fiscal constraints in the in the current year, and also given the fact that uh, the books are uh, basically replaceable. Our operational uh, philosophy on this is going to be when we have a, a Chromebook that fails on a student, we'll give them another Chromebook, and then that Chromebook will come back to our already established uh, maintenance facility and be repaired. Our, our folks are certified to do warranty repairs for Dell and uh, with that, Dell pays us uh, to do that work. So we're gonna, we're gonna try it with, uh, with what we've got and, uh, and be flexible as we look at that uh, in years to come. All right, thank you, Commissioner Jay. Good questions. Uh, Commissioner Smith. Um, Commissioner Daly hasn't went, and I've already went this round, so I believe he should be going next. All righty. Commissioner Schumacher hasn't either, I don't believe. Well, we'll bump you down on the, when I'm looking over here, I'm, I'm trying to keep track of it in order on the right, but uh, go ahead, Commissioner Daly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Smith. Uh, I guess this is for Ron. I've had a couple of people ask me about lease, and I told them that this is not a lease like we would see for an automobile that we turn them, return them in two years or three years. Am I correct? And why are it, we using the term lease instead of purchase? It, it, is a, it is a lease purchase. So they will be ours. It is, it's, it's technically a lease, but after that three year term, they are our air devices. Thank you, Commissioner Daly. And I'm guessing maybe by leasing them, does that allow you to expense them rather than put them into capital? I'm, I'm, I'm guessing Correct. so. Yes. All right, very good. Okay, uh, next we've got uh, Commissioner Schoonmaker, then Anders, then Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Commissioner Daly basically covered most of it, but with an item that's, that's uh, a very limited useful life, um, why wouldn't we just take the money that we have and buy what we can currently with the money that we're going to get as part of the CARES Act? Well, that would not allow us that the funding would be would not be sufficient to get us to a one to a full one to one deployment. Uh, this is a twenty one million dollar investment. So the CARES Act, it, that would have been great. But the CARES Act funding just, you know, is not sufficient to be able to do that. 
what it does allow us to do is to do phase one. Okay. And uh, was this put out to bid? No, we've got a state contract. We have a state, we have a state contract. Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. All right, thank you, Commissioner Skinmaker, uh, Commissioner Anders. Yeah, uh, Mr. Oaks, so two things. Does, does all of our schools have the broadband capacity? Uh, or is there gonna be any upgrading needed at the schools for Wi-Fi spots? Uh, and two, are we gonna convert, if this works, which I hope it does, I think it's a great idea. Uh, are we gonna convert to digital textbooks and save money on, on what we're doing with textbooks and get our updates uh, electronically instead of purchasing new books and sitting them in a warehouse for a long time? Uh, as you may recall, we started uh, building out our wireless infrastructure seven or eight years ago. And uh, we've, we've largely finished that process. We've got about 11 million square feet under our uh, digital uh, 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 Wi-Fi. And uh, it is uh, sufficient to handle uh, the traffic uh, that we're going to get when we bring in these devices. Remember too that we've got devices that we're using right now that that are significant in number. I, I thoroughly anticipate that we'll find uh, some dark holes somewhere in some of our buildings that we'll have to do a little bit of work with, but we do have a very uh, robust, robust Wi-Fi and broadband system. With the uh, uh, discussion of textbooks, that's probably something that's more in Dr. Uh, Ryswick's uh, area. But I will say that we have found over time that uh, there is not a great uh, uh, reduction in cost or uh, operational use between textbooks and computers because of the way the textbook companies structure their financial models. Well, I think this is, I mean, this, this is driving difference in pivoting everything, uh, every, every economy, every market is going to pivot and have to do that. But if you have an electronic, you can update it quicker. Uh, it may cost the same, but you get a more current and a, and a more up-to-date uh, teaching. And, and, if, and if textbook companies don't pivot, they're going to get left behind uh, on the economy in the new market. Yeah, and that's, that's true. And, and with uh, uh, many, if not most of our uh, textbooks, when we purchase those, we get uh, a digital uh, companion uh, that goes with that. But uh, like I say, it doesn't save us any money in the process. Okay, uh, Commissioner Anders, any follow up on that? All right, thank you. Uh, we'll go back. I've got uh, back to Commissioner Smith. Famous hey, chair. Uh, Superintendent Thomas, uh, it's my understanding that uh, this is phase one. I'm assuming that phase two and phase three are just the next two years of the lease purchase program. That's it's, correct, yes, sir. Okay, it's also my understanding that the CARES Act is intended uh, not to replace revenue streams, lost revenue streams, and is intended for uh, one-time costs associated with COVID-19, such as PPE and uh, mitigation. I, I assume that you all have checked with to make sure that this is part of mitigation, being able to go to one-on-one -on -one technology to offset the lack of being able to educate children uh, in a crisis like this and to get us prepared for it in the future. Uh, have you considered, what were you gonna use the other 5 million for? Have you considered just doubling up on the lease payment? We, we did think about doing, doing that initially, but uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll let Ron uh, uh, finish what I'm about to say. But again, we're finding ourselves in a, a real dilemma from a budget standpoint with projected revenues that are coming in uh, for this year, as well as trying to prepare a budget for next year and the shortfall that we're going to be facing. Uh, you know, initially in, in March, early March, we, we were looking at possibly a $20 million uh, uh, increase in revenues. <laughs> Uh, actually, what we're looking at right now is probably uh, spending a, a budget that's going to be uh, next year's budget less than this year's budget. So, you know, we, we, we're finding ourselves in a real dilemma and we're trying to make sure that we, from the standpoint of, uh, of our classroom teachers, making sure that we 
that we are trying to, to minimize the impact to our classrooms as much as we possibly can with facing uh, the budget shortfalls that we're looking at. So um, I'll let Ron jump in and, and if I missed answering any of that, let, let him pick me pick up the pieces. <laughs> no, but yeah, Superintendent Thomas is correct. We, we did consider parking some of that money to fund a portion of, of year two. The problem that, once again, that we are faced with is that it puts considerable strain on the upcoming budget uh, because we would- Hey, uh, Ron, you're, you're, you're coming in scratchy. I don't know if you're too far from the mic or got two mics on, but if you can- see better? Yes. Okay. Uh, yes, we did consider parking some of those dollars, of the remaining dollars in year two. That puts us in fiscal year FY22 budget. Uh, the problem is, is that means we have four to five million dollars sitting in the bank while we're cutting this, the upcoming budget, another four or five million dollars. Um, so, yeah, and, and the other question I think was with regards to acceptable uses of those CARES Act funds. Additional information that was coming out from the feds was that you can't, you cannot use these dollars to replenish shortages of revenue streams. There is a host of items now that have come from the feds and the state on acceptable uses of these dollars. The long and short of it is, and, and we have been in communication with the state and we, we have the states, uh, we, we have this in writing actually. Uh, the state cannot dictate to a local education agency how it is to use those funds. I couldn't and, hear, couldn't hear. Yeah, yeah. Once again, you're getting scratchy again. Um, not really, okay, is this any better? For now. Okay, not really sure what's going on. Where did, uh, where did you, where did, where did I leave off? Did you had had a communication from the state. Okay, the state, this is the long and short of it. The state cannot, and this is according to the state, cannot dictate or, or limit an LEA's use of those funds. I know that the information originally coming out, uh, you know, was that uh, revenue, you can't use this to replenish revenue shortages. I think the distinction here is that you can still attack revenue shortages by how you spend the dollars. And there, the state cannot restrict LEAs from how they spend those dollars. They do, you know, there's-, there's Let's try to let's wrap, try to wrap, that wrap that up real quick. Real quick. Our, okay. our, yeah. Uh, you're breaking the long, up, I'm sorry. The, 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 the long and short of it is, is the state cannot tell LEAs how to use those dollars. We have broad discretion in how we do that. Okay, good deal. Uh, Mr. Chair, one, one final oh. question, I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. Okay, go ahead. At this point, we don't know if the state is going to provide any supplemental funds out of the rainy day fund they have, or if there'll be a a fourth stimulus pass to help offset local revenue shortages by Congress and the Senate. Uh, when do we have to actually have these decisions made by, so that we can structure this in the way that best benefits uh, our school system? I would answer that question that we really need some sort of a decision point um, in time for to align with our budget recommendation because the uses of these funds will directly impact how our budget will unfold for FY21. If right, we use right. be quick, be quick, quick, because you're still breaking up, you're scratchy. Be quick. Okay. The short answer is is I think we, we need to come to a decision point fairly quickly due to the budget. Okay. All right. Commissioner Smith, you still got the floor. Are you done? Okay. Uh, uh, Commissioner Carringer. I'd be glad to let Commissioner Beeler go okay. first. If he hasn't right. spoken. Go ahead, Commissioner Beeler. Uh, it's really just a point of privilege. I just wanted you to know that there's a pretty heavy storm coming through downtown in East Knox County right now. And that could be what's affecting some of these transmissions. Yeah, I, I might add, and I told Commissioner Carringer before the meeting started, the storm that hit this afternoon kind of knocked out my internet. So that 
if I if I drop off because it's been spotchy ever since, I've told uh, Commissioner Carringer to be ready to pick up the baton if for some reason I get knocked out. It, it's already happened twice today. So, uh, but back to, uh, and thank you, Commissioner Beeler. That could have been it. So uh, go ahead, Commissioner Carringer. Yeah, I, I just wanted to bring up the article and hope that everybody saw it. And I believe she sent it to um, Ron and uh, Superintendent Thomas and all from uh, Karen Pershing, our executive director uh, with Drug Coalition. Um, the article where North Carolina was using their school buses uh, as being the Wi-Fi hotspots. And, and I know from having um, cousins in teaching and all and some in Kentucky, uh, when they were delivering their meals, uh, the school buses were doing their normal routes and, and dropping off the meals. So uh, this seemed like a, a really neat ideal and North Carolina is doing it. And I just wanted to make sure that I mentioned that to make sure that everybody gets a chance to go back and read that article. Um, pretty neat uh, on how they can make the school buses hotspots and uh, for the internet in case um, some of the areas they can't get the broadband in. Great. All right. Uh, I'm not seeing anybody else. Uh, the only you know, final antidote I might add is uh, it, just a real quick question. What is our total forecasted enrollment for next year? It's around 60,000. So around 60,000 students times that. And we know that it's around 30, what did you say, 30 bucks per uh, kiddo. Uh, so what is the total insurance premium for the everything all in? I guess I could do the calculator math real quick, a 30 times 60,000 plus the, the faculty ones. 1.8 million. 1.8 million. 1 million, all right. I'll, I would just say that's uh, an interesting budget number to, to crack. And the only thing I might say is we look to uh, something that it, it's a very tangible number and as you look to all of the various booster clubs, uh, local level foundations, different things, maybe that could be even something that the um, Knoxville Education Foundation could look in finding sources of funds because it's difficult. I could see for it, you know fundraisers that try to support you know our, our public schools to raise the seven million. Uh, but uh, you know, part of me wonders if there there may be some room for some philanthropy because it's a it's a much easier bite. When you look at it, thirty dollars per uh, machine versus uh, needing to come up with the, the seven million right there. So, just a thought to, to get on the record as we uh, begin to move forward on this. Okay, all right. That motion, and uh, you know, we spent about an hour on this. Uh, so, but we did have a motion before us, and uh, Madam Clerk, I frankly I can't remember who made the mo the first and the second on that motion. It was uh, Commissioner Anders and Commissioner Biggs. That's correct. So to approve. We, okay, we do need to have a uh, a vote on this one. So, Madam Clerk, would you please lead a roll call vote on this? Commissioner Smith. Yes. Commissioner Smith votes aye. Commissioner Nystrom. Aye. Commissioner Nystrom votes aye. Commissioner Schoonmaker? Aye. Commissioner Schoonmaker votes aye. Commissioner Anders? Aye. Commissioner Anders votes aye. Commissioner Bussler? Aye. Commissioner Bussler votes aye. Commissioner Beeler? Aye. Commissioner Beeler votes aye. Commissioner Daly? Com Commissioner Daly? Commissioner Daly votes aye. I can't hear you, but I see your mouth saying aye. Hey, Commissioner J? Aye. Commissioner J votes aye. Commissioner Biggs? Aye. Commissioner Biggs votes aye. Commissioner Gill? Yes. Commissioner Gill votes aye. Commissioner Carringer? Aye. Commissioner Carringer votes aye. All members present voting aye. It passes. Uh, Madam Clerk, next item. The next item is Resolution, I'm sorry, item number 23, resolution 401. It's approving covenants for permanent maintenance of stormwater facilities and best management practices with Primos Land Company for property located at zero Oak Ridge Highway, CLT parcel number 091 02608. Motion to approve. All right, we have a motion for, for approval. Commissioner Anders, who was the second? Just raise your hand. Okay, and got the motion, the second was uh, Commissioner Daly. Uh, Carson, I think you're the one who uh, pulled this one just to talk a little bit about the uh, approval processes and all this one, uh, to use this one sort of as a placeholder for all of them. So I'll, I'll pass the floor to you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Snowden, uh, 
And Mr. Uh, Commissioner Bustler, if I'm stepping on your toes on your uh, discussion item, I'm sorry, because I asked a question before I seen your discussion item. I've noticed a couple of uh, subdivisions going in in the neighborhood to where the retention ponds or catch basins are almost a third full or getting close to half full. Do we require them to go back in to the original specs before we accept these storm waters? Yes, sir, Commissioner Daly, we do. We hold a hydrology bond until uh, really all the lots are stabilized so that any sediment that uh, gets into that pond uh, is removed and stabilized so that before we uh, turn the subdivision over to the HOA, uh, that that pond is per the design plan. And uh, I guess one of the second questions in the discussion I had with someone, who's responsible for that catch basin after we accept it? If it's in the right of way uh, or in a, um, if it's in the right of way, it's Knox County Engineering, like if it's a catch basin in the road, if it's outside the right of way, uh, it's contained within a permanent drainage easement. And uh, these resolutions, like the one that's being discussed now, item 401, uh, that maintenance is deferred to uh, the HOA long term. Thank you, Mr. Noden. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Is there any additional discussion or uh, clarifying questions on this one? Okay, uh, this motion is properly before us. Uh, Madam Clerk, could you please lead a roll call vote? Yes, Commissioner Nystrom. Aye. Commissioner yeah. Nystrom votes aye. Commissioner Schoonmaker. Aye. Commissioner Schoonmaker votes aye. Commissioner Anders. Aye. Commissioner Anders votes aye. Commissioner Bussler. Aye. Commissioner Bussler votes aye. Commissioner Beeler. Aye. Commissioner Beeler votes aye. Commissioner Daly. Aye. Commissioner Daly votes aye. Commissioner J. Aye. Commissioner J votes aye. Commissioner Biggs. Aye. Commissioner Biggs votes aye. Commissioner Gill. Aye. Commissioner Gill votes aye. Commissioner Carringer. Aye. Commissioner Carringer votes aye. Commissioner Smith. Yes. Commissioner Smith votes aye. All members present voting aye. All right, it passes. Thank you. Okay, uh, Madam Clerk, next item, please. The next item is item number 34, resolution 701. It's approving a limited warranty deed for the acceptance of property located on the Holson River at 1233 Old Strawberry Plains Pike, parcel number 053-012, and known as McBee Furry Landing from the Legacy Parks Foundation to be used to, to create a Knox County Park. Okay, could I get a motion, please? Motion to approve. Okay, we have that. It was a motion from second. Commissioner Beeler and a second. second. That was uh, Commissioner Carringer. Uh, that the, the chair would like to recognize <coughs> White uh, to, to give a brief kind of overview on what's going on with this park, and I know we're glad to get it on the uh, you know, agenda for approval this month. Hey guys, this is Paul White. Um, this is just a formality, but uh, Legacy Parks is donating this land, and we have uh, uh, some plans in the future to uh, do some things out there to make a kayak launch and. Uh, it's a really beautiful piece of property and it's been in the works for a while. We just, with all that's going on with COVID-19, we kept deferring it. So uh, law department's already working on the deed and we're good to go. The, the, the main thing is we had to get the deed in our name in order to uh, be able to accept the funding and grants from legacy parks. Good, but otherwise everything is, uh, Good to go on it? Yes, sir. Okay, great. Okay, all right. Is there uh, any other, any follow-up questions from any of the commissioners? Okay, uh, seeing none. Uh, Madam Clerk, this motion is uh, properly before us. Would you please lead a roll call vote? Commissioner Schoonmaker? Aye. Commissioner Schoonmaker votes aye. Commissioner Anders? Aye. Commissioner Anders votes aye. Commissioner Bussler? Aye. Commissioner Bussler votes aye. Commissioner Beeler? Aye. Commissioner Beeler votes aye. Commissioner Daly? Aye. Commissioner Daly? Aye. Commissioner Daly votes aye. Commissioner Jay? Aye. Commissioner Jay votes aye. Commissioner Biggs? Here. Commissioner Biggs votes aye. Commissioner Gill? Yes. Commissioner Gill votes aye. Commissioner Carringer? Aye. Commissioner Carringer votes aye. Commissioner Smith? Yes. Commissioner Smith votes aye. Commissioner Nystrom. Aye. 
Commissioner Nystrom votes aye. All members present voting aye. It passes. All right, thank you. Uh, Madam Clerk, uh, next item, please. The next item is number 35, resolution 801. It's approving extension one to divine services contract among Knox County, Tennessee and Helen Ross McNabb Center Incorporated for services related to the Behavioral Health Urgent Care Center. Okay, very good. Uh, I'd like to get a motion on this one. I, uh, the chair sees uh, Commissioner Smith's hand raised first. Yes, I'll make a motion to get uh, to get the topic on the floor. I make the motion to uh, pass without recommendation till next Monday's meeting. Second. Second. All right. The uh, motion on the floor is to send forward with no recommendation the next month. I think next Tuesday's meeting uh, by Commissioner Smith with a uh, second by Commissioner uh, Gill. All right. That motion's on the floor. Commissioner Smith, you still have the floor. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just uh, we're in a time right now where we are looking at a lot of funding issues and we're looking to enter a contract that's uh, about 2.4 million dollars over three years. This program has changed a lot since it originated. There's no more state funding for operation. Uh, it went from a 72 hour program to a 24 hour program. Between the county and the city there's about 1.4 million dollars spent annually uh, they're averaging about 520 patients a year. That's an average of uh, probably five a day when they have 16 beds, which means they're operating at somewhere around 30 to 35% capacity. And I'm not sure if we're funding that 100% capacity or for the amount uh, that they're actually treating. I spoke with uh, uh, Jason Lay today and I am gonna meet with him next week. We received uh, information very late in the day. Mm -hmm. I just wanna meet with him and go over this to uh, make sure that one, that people are getting the treatment they needed and the service they need, and that our taxpayers are getting the efficiencies they need. Okay. All right, any uh, additional follow-up questions, Commissioner Smith? No, right. sir. Okay, what I, what I might do is uh, if we've got, you know, I, I'll kind of look to the body on this. I'm sure that I think that there's some, probably some folks have been sent a link from Helen Ross McNabb. Uh, I know we've also gotten the, uh, the update. Uh, you know, I, I guess uh, knowing that we'll have about a, a week or so to do a little bit of homework or additional follow-up, uh, if there's someone from Helen Ross McNabb, I'm not sure if it's Houston or Jerry has been uh, Zoomed a link uh, before we, and by the way, for my fellow commissioners, just because we're Zoom, I, I know we've got a long meeting tonight. I'm planning on maybe taking a uh, five to 10 minute break at around seven o'clock or so. Uh, we'll, you can turn your cameras off and we'll, we'll take a quick uh, five to 10 minute break around seven. But if uh, Jerry or Houston's here that would just like to kind of give an, uh, an update on this, uh, I think that would be appropriate uh, for, uh, for right now. But before then, I do recognize that uh, Commissioner Schoonmaker has got a, a hand raised. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, obviously, uh, Commissioner Smith, you've done the research on this. So basically, you said it was about 500 patients per year. Was that roughly the number? I, I couldn't quite hear it. Uh, the information I gave us today, it was like 376 through three quarters. If you extrapolate that out, it's about 125 patients a quarter, which comes to a little bit uh, 5 to 510 annually. Okay, and so we're spending about $3,000 on them for a 24 hour period? Uh, there, there are other services that they provide once they leave. And that's some of the information I'm looking for. How much is the uh, follow up services that are provided? Okay, thank you. Yeah, I think, yeah, the, the commissioner's point you just made is uh, if I might, uh, Commissioner Smith, take the liberty of restating your question, you're, it, it's sort of say, uh, all right, if you look at it purely from the ad admissions point of view, here's the math, here's the, the census board, but then part of your follow-up question is, so what does the case management look like post uh, discharge? And knowing that some of this money that we don't see on the front end, we see this, you know, how much are they investing in in terms of uh, case management uh, with that said? So I think I see uh, Houston uh, Smeltzer from Helen Ross McNabb on here. So I'll, I'll go ahead and recognize him um, unless your boss Jerry is is also uh, around, um, Houston, are, are floor yours? 
Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Nystrom. If you would let Jason Lay's connection speak, we're all three together on his link. Uh, it's actually in terms of links, it's going to be up to Mr. Rob Link to handle. I think Jason's already in the room. He just needs to turn his mic on. It's on. And if multiple people in the room have got microphones on or whatnot, you guys need to turn that down because I think that can kind of create feedback that makes it sound horrible. So, uh, Jason, if you're there, uh, we'll, we'll hand the floor to you. And but just turn things down to one, one mic line if there's multiple folks. Okay. Can you hear us now, Commissioner? Yes. Thank you. Sorry about that. We thought we'd all get in the same room to make it easier for uh, us to answer commission's questions. And I'm trying to leave the meeting so that I'm not creating a, a background issue. Okay, I think we're all ready. Uh, can you hear us okay, uh, Chairman? You now you're muted. Oh, he can. can you hear us now? Yes, I, I can hear you fine. Sorry, I was muted myself. Sorry about that. Um, I'm here with uh, Jason Lay, our CFO, and Leanne Human Hilliard, uh, who's our regional VP for clinical services. And we're happy to answer any questions tonight. And we'll be on Zoom uh, next Tuesday uh, or next Monday as well. Uh, the Behavioral Health Urgent Care Center is a program that was created by the city of Knoxville and Knoxville, uh, Knox County government. It took about a 10 year process to develop uh, this program as a way to address overcrowding in Knox County Jail. Uh, as uh, Commissioner Smith mentioned, uh, last year this program received a pretty good gut punch in terms of a funding cut from the state of Tennessee. And so we retooled the programming to uh, work with the budgeting dollars that we had available to us. So we're happy to address uh, any questions you have. Um, Leanne has lots of uh, clinical data that I think would be helpful as you consider approving this funding. I do know that we're on city council's agenda tomorrow night for their piece of the funding for the same program. What I might do just to kind of open it up, I mean, can you give me kind of an update? Uh, I know there'll be, be some follow up with uh, Mr. Lay, but you know, right now, and there may be some additional questions next week. But you know, can you uh, just at a uh, you know, maybe 30,000 feet, you know, talk a little bit about the outcomes that y'all are, are getting? Uh, you know, just kind of you talk fiscally about where the program had changed after the, uh, the state changed. But I mean, uh, ultimately, I know we're, there will be some additional research between now and Tuesday. But uh, just at more of a 30,000 foot, you know, kind of a little more info on the outcomes that you're getting. Absolutely. Uh, Leanne has uh, been collecting more data for this program than maybe any other program we operate at the McNabb Center. And she has most of that in her hands. So I'll turn it over to Leanne. Thank you. Um, thank you, everyone. I will just give you that, you know, pretty far backdrop. Um, outline of, of what our outcomes are looking like. Um, Commissioner Smith was exactly right. We changed from a 72-hour uh, unit to a 24-hour unit. Uh, in doing so, we wanted to make sure that we heard from Commission last year their concerns on a couple of items. We heard that, or I heard, that um, everybody, uh, you know, we, we liked the concept of being able to get individuals diverted from jail. That was very important by passing that process and getting stabilized for individuals who are mental Ill, have a mental illness or substance use disorder. Um, the feedback we did get was, even though we were having some great outcomes on engaging people in their first appointment post program into outpatient mental health services, we couldn't tell you all if they were getting follow-up appointments. Um, the other thing that we heard is we didn't have a lot of outcome data around um, housing and around employment. So when we revamped the program, we reduced the 24 hour or the 72 to 24 and reduced the capacity to six beds. So we were having to find savings where we could and balancing that on the, the need of what we were seeing being utilized at the, at the drop-off center of the buck. 
We also then increased a very, created a very intensive community-based service. And that's what you're gonna see in the documents called FACT. It's an evidence-based pro program, uh, Forensic Assertive Community Treatment. So those are designed for, to be extremely intensive. There is no other level of service like that in our community right now, unless you have uh, insurance um, through TennCare and um, meet a, a lot of criteria for that. So it was a huge gap in our community, and I think it was a gap for the individuals that we saw coming through the program. So some of the outcomes that we've seen, um, we still see uh, mostly males, although we see a, a significant amount of females, about 60% um, are going to be male. Uh, the average age are still in your 40s. Uh, that's what we're continuing to see. 70% of the individuals we're serving remain uninsured. So that is a, a real particular challenge for us because they don't aren't eligible for any benefits at that point and can't get a lot of services. So we're relying on safety net funding and, and funding for, for the uninsured. 50% um, of the individuals that we're seeing are coming in homeless. So no insurance, no housing. 50% um, have a co-occurring mental illness. So all of the individuals that we serve have either a mental health or substance use disorder. Over 50% have both. And we track that when our clinicians and physicians are seeing when they come in. We are still seeing a large number of individuals who come into the drop-off center receive uh, or accept referrals to go to an outpatient mental health or substance use appointment where 68% of them are still making that appointment, which is huge. Your private insurance, your, your, your uh, 10 care insurance companies benchmark that around 30%. And so 68 is really good at kept keeping that initial appointment. Um, for individuals, after they come to the, to the drop off portion of the buck, if they are, um, I'm trying the best way to say this. If they have more challenges, then they might be eligible for that next step within the BUC program called the FACT program. And we're seeing about 50% of those people rolling into that program. Um, they are the ones who are getting the very intensive community-based services. We're seeing um, increase in employment. We're seeing increase in housing. Um, we keep the individuals at an average of three months. Um, some longer, some shorter if need be. It's all based on individual need. Um, and then 48% of over all of our individuals that we serve um, never go back and have another jail day for six months after they leave our program. And that's compared to a national benchmark of about 68 that we've seen. Um, and then we've seen a very short, um, a small amount of people return to the BHUC. That's still hovering around 18% of recidivism back to the BHUC. So we're still happy with that number. You know, we don't want to see a revolving door, but we certainly want to get people who have, uh, are in our community, who have a mental illness, who are struggling. They're not having insurance. They're not being engaged with their mental health centers, even if that is us, um, because of all of the challenges that, that they are presented with on a daily basis. And so I'm very proud of what the program has done. They have served um, over 500 last year. They were on track to do the same this year. Um, and we are still opening, opened in the, uh, you know, in the midst of COVID and everything. The clinicians and staff have been doing a fantastic job of still meeting the needs of those people in our community. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Smith, you got a follow-up question? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I was kind of surprised that 31% does have insurance. Are, are we billing their insurance companies for the services? We are. So I think that's pretty challenging because, if, you know, if they have commercial insurance, their commercial insurance may or may not um, accept that level of care. You know, a lot of that service you have to get pre-authorized. And, you know, that unfortunately, I don't, I don't, you know, I don't think they consider jail diversion much of a, a diversion <laughs> concern for them. Um, but we are working with the Department of Mental Health to see if we can get any of these individuals connected with the Behavioral Health Safety Net Program. So, you know, our goal is that um, we secure as much third party as we can, even though it's very challenging. But if we can't do it for the first day of services, we certainly want to see if we can encourage them before we reconnect them with other programming. Okay. And uh, do we have a do we have a number on how many people are making second and third appointments? And I believe you had uh, 
So did you say we're down to six beds there? What is the rest of that facility being used for? So there, so that facility is being used to staff all of the community-based service providers. So it's a, it's a very small facility when you think about it. Um, but then what we've done is turned in the other two bedrooms into the office staff for the fact, the community-based component. Now, all of their service is being provided in the homes, in the community, in the streets. Okay. And they're the outreach. I, I call it the outreach program. That's great. That's a great name. That's outreach. Mm -hmm. So basically 48% of the people that come through, and, and I know it's better than the national mark, but still 48% are winding up back in the jail at, within six months from uh, coming into the center. And you said something about providing services up to three months after their visit. Is that correct? Yes. Now that can vary depending on their needs, but the fact portion of the program is really designed to capture people who, if you sent them to an outpatient service, they might not be successful or they meet, may need something more intensive, but not quite meet the need of inpatient hospitalization. They need something in between. Okay, and, and, and I appreciate you talking to me earlier today and, 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 and Jason, and I, I, I'll save the rest of my questions because I know this, is, uh, this meeting is going to run long. I look forward to meeting with you all this week. We, us as well. Absolutely. Thank you. All right, uh, thank you, Commissioner Smith. Uh, next, uh, Commissioner Jay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, on page seven of your presentation, you talked about the uh, economic impact of or the economic cost of what it takes to uh, have somebody in jail for a day versus what it has uh, having somebody in the BHUG. On the reverse side, um, do you have any data that talks about the services or social impact of uh, people after the fact? Uh, you know, if they don't go through the program, what might it cost society in, in a greater scheme versus if they go through the BHUG program, what it might cost society in the in the greater um, umbrella of services. I know that's a, a big you know, data point to, to capture, but I, I know that you guys think about that of, of is this is all to do with the cost analysis of the BHUG. Is it worth the investment on the front end to save money societally on the back end? Do you, do you look at that at all? Thank you. Uh, yes, yes, we do. Um, you know, all of our outcomes and data comes to our quality and uh, compliance department. So I will get with them to see all of the research that they, you know, kind of point to. And we can certainly have that ready for you next week. But I will say, depending on what you're, what, what report you're looking at, it's savings anywhere from um, EDs to inpatient hospitalization, which are thousands of dollars. Um, jail days for individuals who need psychotropic medications and um, increased uh, involvement in the jail. You know, some people, some uh, research captures that. And then some research will, uh, will capture quality of life, um, which is hard to price tag on that. But um, I can certainly pull that and uh, have that ready for you next week. Thank you very much. Sure. All right, thank you. There are any other uh, follow-up questions? I know that we'll, we'll probably continue to have some more uh, discussion next week on this one. All right, the motion that's on the floor is to send this forward with uh, no recommendation to uh, next week's voting meeting. Uh, I'm seeing no other uh, questions. I'm gonna go ahead and call for a vote. So Madam Clerk, could you please call for a vote? Commissioner Anders. Aye. Commissioner Anders, false aye. Commissioner Bussler. Aye. Commissioner Bussler, false aye. Commissioner Beeler? Aye. Commissioner Beeler, false aye. Commissioner Daly? Aye. Commissioner Daly, false aye. Commissioner Jay? Aye. Commissioner Jay, false aye. Commissioner Biggs? Aye. Commissioner Biggs, false aye. Commissioner Gill? Yes. Commissioner Gill, false aye. Commissioner Carringer? Aye. Commissioner Carringer, false aye. Commissioner Smith? Yes. Commissioner Smith, false aye. Commissioner Nystrom? Aye. Commissioner Nystrom, false aye. Commissioner Schoonmaker? Aye. Mr. Schoenmaker votes aye. All members voting aye. Okay, it passes. Uh, now, as I said earlier, now is, uh, in fact, usually when we have our face-to-face -face meetings, if we're not done, we usually take a break here at about seven o'clock. So uh, what my recommendation is uh, to the, my fellow commissioners is maybe put stop video or, or you know, turn off your video, turn off your mic. You know, I'll take a 10, 12 minute uh, break here. Uh, Zach, if you, 
it's kind of like the movies, I guess, where you can post you know, uh, intermission message. I don't know if you have that capability or not, but do not log off of the Zoom. We are not going to uh, start a, a new meeting. We're just gonna take a break and I'll see everybody in about uh, 12 minutes or so. Thank you.
it looks like, let's see, we've got uh, Justin Biggs and Commissioner Jay. Um, we'll get things started as soon as they're back. All right, I'm going to give Commissioner Jay about one more minute, then we'll start. All right, can everybody hear me? Okay, good. We'll go ahead and uh, start the meeting. Uh, welcome back from our, our little recess. Uh, so uh, we uh, just closed out on the uh, Holland Ross McNabb item. So, uh, and that was uh, approved and sent forward with no recommendation to next week's meeting, which is gonna be Tuesday. So uh, Madam Clerk, what's the uh, next item on our agenda? We're on item number 38, which is resolution 804. It's approving a formal inter internal service fund reserve policy. All right, very good. Can I get a, a motion on this one, please? Motion, um, to, approve. motion to approve. Okay, we have a motion for uh, approval from Commissioner Schoonmaker. And who was the second? Second. All right, the second was Commissioner Gill. Okay, that's the motion that's on the floor. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, recognize uh, Mr. Caldwell from the finance department. Uh, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, basically, what we're doing here is putting more uh, an additional policy in place that will help with our rating agencies with movies and S and P um, as we go forward and expect that, uh, of course, a downturn in revenue related to COVID nineteen. So, what this does is just allows us to move any excess uh, uh, fund balance uh, from those. Uh, particular balance sheets up front to the general fund and it'll be in a committed state and can't be spent for anything else but it just gets it on the front of air financial statements so the agencies can see it and they also like uh, when you're when you put more controls in place and, and measured it shows that management is taking things serious and, um, and looking just to make us uh, I guess more whole from a financial standpoint Okay, uh, there, there may be some other questions, but I mean, my personal take, if I might weigh in on this one first, was that when I read through all of the uh, policies and procedures that you had uh, proposed for uh, changes to the department, the way we, uh, we uh, allocate and do uh, transfers, it looked like, especially in light of our current situation, that in a way you're sort of ratifying or putting in writing a lot of the things that we probably would have had to do. And by doing that also put in a way that more clearly communicates it. But these, they all struck me as things that a prudent business person would do, but it, now it's in writing. At least that was kind of my, my take. And I think that was what I mentioned when I called you about it last week. Yeah, you're spot on and that's correct. And this is the first policy of two that we will bring, as I mentioned to you, Next month, we will bring a contingency spending plan uh, to have you all adopt or we can consider and hopefully adopt as it relates that we already got basically um, in principle that we put in place that we want to put it in writing, which helps uh, just to, to codify all those things. Okay. Uh, any of the stuff uh, been is this kind of consistent with what the GFOA has uh, recommended as uh, government, municipal finance departments across the country have been going through? Yes, uh, it's uh, recommended guidance and we kind of took our uh, policy from them and some others that we uh, uh, thought were, were good uh, models. And ultimately it's just, uh, we have a general fund, fund balance policy 
So it just kind of strengthens along those lines. We already have a debt service policy. So we just want to expand on what we've already got in place. Okay, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Jay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Caldwell, I noticed in the policy um, section three, it talks about the reserve levels of three months or 25% of revenues. Um, there's been a lot of talk about the fund balance uh, of Knox County. And can you help me just understand what a normal three months of, you know, what that reserve level minimum would often look like dollar wise? Sure, so with internal ser service funds, it, it, it will vary. Like we have, uh, we have a vehicle service fund, which is operated by, by Jim Snowden. So it's, it's level will be fairly, a low, uh, but then on the other uh, spectrum, you'll have our um, uh, self-insured health insurance fund, which we have about a $30 million budget to it. So you just do three months of that, and, and that could be six, eight, eight million dollars. And so uh, we have a, about six or eight different uh, vehicle service funds. We, we have I mean, internal service funds from building maintenance, but you got about $11 million budget. And uh, we also have like a, a mailroom service fund. So all these funds, uh, basically what happens is we charge for these services and it will be expensed uh, to the county departments and the revenue is moved in here. So all we're basically saying- Guys, can you turn that off? Thank you. Is, is we just want the ability to show that on the front of our of our financial statements and show it as, as committed fund balance. All right, thank you very much. Sorry for the interruption there. No All right, thank you. Were there any other uh, questions or uh, Chris, any additional follow-up you'd, you'd like to make on, on this one? And uh, Larson, do uh, your, your sons, do they need to comment on this at all? Boys, no, boys, I just, boys. I swear it's like a, it's like a magnet of, uh, of noise as soon as it goes on. So no, thank you though. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. This motion is, uh, properly before us, uh, Madam Clerk, who were the, uh, who was the first and the second on this one? If you could restate that, please. It was, uh, was Commissioner Schoonmaker made the motion seconded by Commissioner Gill. Okay. Very good. All right. Uh, Madam Clerk, could you have a uh, roll call vote, please? Okay. Commissioner Bussler. Yes. Commissioner Bussler votes aye. Mm. Commissioner Beeler? Aye. Commissioner Beeler votes aye. Commissioner Daly? Aye. Commissioner Daly votes aye. Commissioner J? Aye. Commissioner J votes aye. Commissioner Biggs? Aye. Commissioner Biggs votes aye. Commissioner Gill? Yes. Commissioner Gill votes aye. Commissioner Carringer? Aye. Commissioner Carringer votes aye. Commissioner Smith? Yes. Commissioner Smith votes aye. Commissioner Nystrom? Aye. Commissioner Nystrom votes aye. Commissioner Schoonmaker? Aye. Commissioner Schoonmaker votes aye. Commissioner Anders. Aye. Commissioner Anders votes aye. All members present voting aye. All right. Uh, thank you, Madam Clerk. That uh, passes. Uh, and what is the uh, the next item on the agenda? The next item is number 42, resolution 904. It's declaring Knox County, Tennessee, a Second Amendment constitutional county. All right. Thank you. All right. Could I get a uh, motion on the floor for consideration? Motion to send without any recommendation. Okay. All right. We have a motion to send forward no recommendation from Commissioner Daly. And I'm going to look to you, Commissioner Beeler. I know you were the uh, the co-sponsor with that. Would you like to make the second? Second. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right. Thank you. All right. Um, I'll go ahead. Uh, Commissioner, I, I see who. Yeah. All right. Commissioner Anders has got his hand raised. You've made the motion, but it looks like Commissioner Anders has got the first question on this. So the chair recognizes Commissioner Anders. Yeah, I just have a, a question for the law director to kind of look into. I, you know, I, I'm pro Second Amendment as anybody, but uh, Mr. Law Director, does this have any bearing on the laws that we follow uh, or possibly could follow if it comes from a state or local or state or federal government in regard to does this change anything if we if we adopt this uh, item? Uh, it only just shows a policy position. The uh, Current law, the Second Amendment, of course, the federal trumps everything, and the limitation on the state is totally about carry, and that's the only uh, restriction that the state legislature has, other than, of course, you know, reckless endangerment and those type things that are criminal acts. 
Uh, and this is a, a policy decision made on the board by this board. Any legal questions would be answered by the Second Amendment and would be answered by the Tennessee Constitution because we personally don't have any regulatory rights at the county level to, to do anything with guns. When you say it's a policy decision, what, does it, what policy does it create? Whatever you all are saying that you want to do is, is to support. It's a statement of support to the Second Amendment. It's, it's more of a political statement than it is a legal statement. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Let me demute myself. Uh, Mr. Law Director, I may have a question. This uh, sort of falls into, uh, uh, you know, almost into Sharm's area. And I kind of may, I may have answered this. Uh, to be perfectly frank, this was something I was paying attention to months ago. And then in light of COVID, it's uh, just, I really, until today came up, I really haven't put that much, much time into it. But one uh, clarifying question on this one is, you know, it, it and you just said that ultimately everything is up to the feds and the state in terms of any actual policy that's got uh, that's meaningful. Uh, I guess my my question was, you know, and Commissioner Anders and I had worked together in the past in areas where you see orders of protection, and often with with orders of protection, you have folks who have been uh, their the right to carry a firearm, especially when they're around the person that maybe filed the order of protection, is um, in effect. Uh, you know, I, I just I wonder, you know, how does this a, apply in that case? Um, what if you've got somebody who's, say, a defense attorney for somebody who's got an order of protection? Or if we try to send uh, a sheriff's guy out to arrest somebody for you know, breaking the order, and then they were to say, well, you use the sheriff. Uh, you know, I just I, I wanted to make sure that we're not kind of th throwing a, uh, a bone to folks who might be wanting to use that um, as a policy, that's my, my, the first thing that kind of went through my mind on this one. Okay, uh, the ranking order, of course, anything, a resolution is below an ordinance, number one. Uh, number two, uh, the order of protection is statutory and it falls under the criminal issues of the state, which they have total authority. And we, our resolutions or ordinances, unless they are totally verbatim in alignment, which we don't have any jurisdiction over, uh, would have no bearing. So the truth is the second amendment would be a federal issue in federal court. Uh, the, the order of protections would be a state issue under state criminal law. Uh, and that would also fall under state civil law as it relates to uh, civil type orders of protection. Uh, so, um, any time a gun would be involved, it, it would be at the state level and we don't have any jurisdiction at all. So I, even whatever we do as a resolution, you're basically saying that we're supporting the federal law and we're supporting the state law as written because there's nothing more you can do. Okay, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Jay, and then uh, I actually, that was it, uh, Larson or John, I'm not sure which one of you uh, clicked your light on. I'll go with uh, Commissioner Jay first and then follow. All right, all right, John, you're pointing him, but on my screen, he's over here. So uh, Commissioner Jay first and then uh, Commissioner Schoonmaker. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I have a, uh, two questions. I have second questions I have are for the law department, but if you'll allow me, I, I have a question for our sponsors of the bill, which um, could be uh, you know, Commissioner Daly or Beeler. It's a pretty basic question. What what problem does this solve for Knox County? This is not a problem solver at all. It's nothing to do with the law. It's nothing to do with the federal law. This is just a statement that uh, we in Knox County support the Second Amendment. We raised our right hand and swore by the Constitution of the United States and the state of Tennessee and the charter of Knox County. And part of this is that we support the Second Amendment and we, you know, since the COVID crisis has come about, <clears throat> we don't hear as much, but we did. You know, we got the red flag laws. We've got other laws, other states that are going beyond what really the Second Amendment is. That's not what this is about. It does not, it, it does not cover a certain, any type of laws or whatsoever. This is just a statement that says, I personally believe in the Second Amendment and that I will defend the Second Amendment 
as much as we can. And it's nothing but besides that. This resolution has no teeth as far as uh, protecting the, uh, any law or overriding law. This is just stating that I believe that the citizens of Knox, that we should support the uh, right to carry. Just to follow up on that, when we all took our oath of office, we swore by, by oath that we uphold the Constitution, the state of Tennessee laws, and state of Tennessee Constitution and the Charter of Knox County which includes everything it, in, in doing something like this, you know, why are we reaffirming one constitutional amendment and not all the constitutional amendments? I mean, it's, it's, it, we, we've all done this. All 11 of us took the same oath and we've all pledged allegiance, you know, or, or pledged our oath to uphold all of those constitutional laws. And I just, you know, it seems an unnecessary use of our, our, legislative time to then single out one of those, you know, 11 and move, you know, one of those and move on um, from that. And then it opens up, I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll go to my second question to continue, you know, discussion. And that's really for the, the law department by doing this, does this open up Knox County to further liability, um, whether it be to do with guns or something else, perhaps, you know, does it open us up to somebody filing a lawsuit against Knox County saying, you know, um, I, uh, you know, any any number of other things that are constitutional rights. It, does it say you're picking and choosing which ones you affirm and don't affirm? I mean, does it open us up to to further lawsuits, which will cost time and will cost money? Well, Commissioner, it's hard to speculate on what people will sue over. Uh, I'm amazed almost every day at some things that come in. Uh, I don't see that it gives you any more exposure on a policy decision any more than you have already said uh, that I take an oath to uphold the Constitution of the United States. Uh, and anything you do enhance or otherwise to that, um, you still have that pledge. So I don't see, um, as long as you're in, it's like being in uh, alignment with the state on any mandate the, you have 11th Amendment protections. So if you're in alignment with the federal government, you have protections. If you're in alignment with the Constitution, you have protections. If you're in alignment with the state constitution and all, uh, uh, theirs is limited to carry, you have protection. And basically we don't vote on anything to do with guns anyway. Uh, under our power, we, we can only affirm what we've already done or what, what our limits are. Uh, so, I, I don't see where we would have much exposure one way or the other uh, under that we don't already have under the Second Amendment or under the state constitution. Mr. Armstrong, I've um, I've heard you say many times over the years that one commission shouldn't act on items that tell or hinder future commissions. Wouldn't this not do that? All this commission is saying is that they support the Second Amendment, and every commissioner that is sworn in is saying they support the Second Amendment. So it's not in conflict with what you, what every commissioner is required to do. So I don't know that it's any different than an oath of office whereby you're upholding the Constitution of the United States. Uh, so I, this would be probably an exception uh, even, even if you were doing the First Amendment, back to your point, you know, how many do you want to do? <clears throat> there, you're, you're not holding a, any future commissioner to any standard that they're not already going to be held to above your resolution is what I'm trying to say. And just to clarify, you, you did say that federal and state laws supersede local laws and, and we, this essentially has no legal teeth to it that isn't already... Uh, directed by the state or the federal level, correct? Right. This is just a personal policy statement on behalf of each individual commissioner. Thank you very much. Uh -huh. Mr. Chairman, may I respond to the original question as a co-sponsor? Sure. Uh, go ahead, Commissioner Beeler. Thank you. Yeah, I, you know, I think with all that, that's been discussed and the law director's answers and so forth, the question, is, the, the legitimate question is, well, if it has no teeth, then why are we doing it? Um, 
I think that there, there is a perception among a lot of folks, especially in our part of the, of the world, our part of the country, that the Second Amendment is uniquely under attack, especially among uh, the, the first 10. Um, you know, I, for instance, I'm not, a, I'm not a, 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 a gun enthusiast. I'm not a gun collector. I'm not even a hunter. I, I, you know, I, I don't have anything against it, but, but I, I don't have time and love football too much to be a hunter. And, uh, but I'm a constitutionalist, and I think that the Second Amendment is so sacred uh, that our founders put it second in, in, the, in, in the Bill of Rights as they began to amend the Constitution. They didn't put it ninth or 10th or 24th. They put it second because if, if you're going to have a free constitutional republic where individuals are free to speak their mind, worship as they please, and own private property, then it is simply inherent that they have to have the right to protect themselves, what they say, and their property. And so I, I think in declaring a, a Second Amendment a constitutional county or sanctuary county, whatever you want to call it, um, it's a declaration that in Knox County, we do not welcome any mitigation of the Second Amendment rights based on whatever ideological winds might be blowing in Washington at any given time. And we do not welcome any federal regulations that would usurp Second Amendment rights of the people. It's a declaration. If, if you think it's an unnecessary declaration or one that you don't agree with, then obviously you wouldn't want to vote for it. Uh, but that's that's the reason for it, from my standpoint. Chairman, if I am permitted to just kind of I mean, go ahead. You guys are having a civil conversation. That's fine. And uh, you asked a question. Commissioner Beeler responded to it. And if you've got a follow up, that's 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 you know what? That's how we're supposed to do these things. So uh, go right ahead. Thank you. Um, in just looking at the resolution, I mean, it it clearly says Board of Commissioners of Knox County will not authorize or appropriate government funds, resources, employees, agencies, contractors, buildings or offices for the purpose of enforcing or assisting in the enforcement of any element of such acts, laws, orders, mandates rules or regulations that are fringe around the people to write and bear arms as described by the United States Supreme Court. So let's say, let's just play a hypothetical. Let's say something changes on a federal level with our, with our laws. Any, it could be a constitutional amendment again, it could be a different law, or let's say something changes on a state law. This is essentially saying that, you know, we would not enforce that, um, you know, I guess it goes back to as described by the United Supreme Court or the Supreme Court of the Tennessee General Assembly. So, um, you know, I guess if if those are changed, we would have to follow those laws. But it, it also sort of it, it mixes words in saying we're not going to authorize anybody to do anything except if. But that's that's exactly how we operate now, and that's what's so confusing to me. If we have laws that say we must do X, Y, and Z based on a federal or state level, we follow those laws and we implement those laws and we put resources against those laws. So it, it, it essentially changes nothing about what we're currently operating under right now. And it's it, that's the part that's a little confusing as to w why are we spending time and energy reaffirming the thing that we do currently? We don't do that for the other one through seven articles or the one through 27 amendments. Um, so that I, I think that Maybe we're talking in the same thing, but I, that's just confusing as to why to single this one out unless it is purely for a political gain or some sort of way to polarize factions of people unnecessarily because we do this now. Okay. Um, I'm not sure, uh, Commissioner Beerley, you've already weighed in. Uh, Commissioner Jay, you had a follow-up. I'm gonna move down the list here. I know Commissioner Schoonmaker had chimed in earlier and um, Commissioner Beeler, I'm seeing that your, your blue hand is still up. I'm not sure if you want to respond real quick there, mm -hmm. or and then we can move on to Commissioner Schoonmaker. So yeah, I, I would just like to respond and say, you know, with all due respect to my colleague, you know, it's not for political gain uh, to, to make a declaration uh, to protect the Second Amendment rights of constituents that have asked us to do that. And the overwhelming majority of the emails I've received on this have asked us to do this. And so that, that's my reason. All right, very good. Um, uh, Commissioner Daly, as a sponsor, go ahead. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I agree with uh, Commissioner Beeler that uh, it's overwhelming support for, uh, for this. And 
you know, if you don't, if you don't want to support the resolution, vote no. If you want to support it, vote yes. It's not, it's, it's not there for political gain. And I, you know, I take exception to that. I'm not going, I just, that's not what this is all about. This is about the Second Amendment, whether we Knox County, as a commissioner, I, speaking as I only, I support it. Uh, yeah, sure, we could do a resolution to answer Commissioner Jay's, and I, I don't really want a response. But yeah, we could do all all the amendments, all the Bill of Rights, as, you, know, as, um, you know, we confirm every one of them, but it seems like as Commissioner Beeler has said, we are under attack on the two A on the Second Amendment, and there's not much more that we can say that you know our founding fathers thought long and hard, and Commissioner Beeler is 100% correct. It was the second item under the amendments, and it, it's not going to change any laws. It's not going to affect anything. It's just saying that Carson Daly will vote yes to affirm the Second Amendment, and that's all it is. All right, uh, thank you, Commissioner Daly. Uh, moving on, we've got, uh, I'll let, uh, and I'm frankly, I'm not sure who weighed in first, either uh, Commissioner Gill or Commissioner Bustler, but I'll go ahead and uh, recognize Commissioner Gill. I, I thought I was- oh, so, John, I'm sorry, you were next. I'm sorry, John, you were one of the first ones in there. Sorry, I, I was mentally moving on. So go ahead, Commissioner Schoonmaker, and then we'll go Commissioner Schoonmaker, then uh, Gill, then Bustler. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, possibly maybe the two sponsors of the resolution would uh, like to do just a quick recap. Uh, it's my understanding that this type of a resolution is passed in uh, 58 of the 95 counties in Tennessee. Um, and, and there may be some more current information to that. So Basically, 875 of our colleagues across the state have already affirmed that they support the Second Amendment. So before next Tuesday night, maybe uh, the sponsors would like to take the opportunity to just get the current data of actually how many counties in Tennessee have, uh, have uh, already signed off on this. Okay, thank you, good point. And uh, back to you, Commissioner Gill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and I appreciate the words of the two sponsors, but I represent a constituency that strongly opposed, even by the uh, emails that we've received. If you want to affirm your Second Amendment right, do it without creating a policy for the body and speaking for it. Um, and I appreciate the arguments on both sides of the Second Amendment, um, and, and I can appreciate fully what's in the Constitution both positive and negative in terms of its overall application for certain groups in this country. Um, so no, I do not support um, the, op the, uh, the uh, Second Amendment, um, especially coming from this body. And I also posted what the Tennessee County Commissioners Association uh, published regarding um, creating a resolution regarding this. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Gill. Uh, Commissioner Bussler. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, a number of things that we look at all the time and we talk about, well, they're not going to challenge this amendment. We're not going to have this thing occur against us. But if you look right now under this coronavirus that we're under, the 14th Amendment has been really walked on. We have given up so many rights under this that's going on right now. And I appreciate that the two commissioners said, you know, we're gonna confirm the second amendment, which is to protect us not from each other, but from the government which governs us. And at this point in time, a lot of people are worried about this and it's just saying, we assert your right to have this amendment for your protection against overbearing government. And I think that's one of the things that a lot of people want to hear. And the thing about something else about, will this affect future uh, commissioners? Well, any time that you pass anything that goes more than five years, you've affected a commissioner that's coming into an office. And we do that a number of times where we do resolutions on and on and on. Now, whether we support it or we don't support it, the thing of it is the people want to know 
where you stand. They brought this up and they're going to ask the question, where do you stand? And I know where I'm going to stand and what I want to vote on it. It means it has no teeth in it, but it does say we support the Constitution and the Bill of Rights for the people of the United States, for everybody. It includes everybody. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Commissioner Bussler. Uh, Commissioner Deal, I see your, your your blue hand is still raised over there. I'm not sure if you desire me to come back to you or not. Okay, thank you. And Commissioner Daly, see that you wanted to weigh in. I, I got, if you don't mind, I might take a little chair's uh, privilege just to, to mention something about this one. And I'll admit that I'm uh, on the front end, I'm being a little bit nitpicky on this one because uh, there's so, uh, this this resolution, there's so much to it. I mean, there it, it's, uh, kind of like hiring a first year law student to justify a brief or something like that. And for it didn't make sense to me on the front end until I started reading it a little bit from the back end. I almost feel like it's upside down um, in that, that the part that we've talked about and debated the most is actually on the last page, which and the last sentence on it where you know, we've talked about how everything is subject to uh, the Supreme Court, the Tennessee Supreme Court and the Tennessee General Assembly. And then it kind of, it almost, this whole resolution almost reads up. Uh, from, it's almost, if, if I were doing it, I would have started with that and then added anything else uh, in, into it. So it, it just seems a little bit, uh, and I, I could nitpick on it. And once again, I'm just now kind of getting into this. I was following it. Uh, closely just because so I saw a lot of other counties passing these and it was on my radar back at the first of the year, but it's really not not here. Um, so I, I guess I appreciate the motion that we have to send forward no recommendations. So that at least speaking for myself, I can you know research this and look into it a little bit bit more, make sure we don't have any unintended outcomes or or, or anything on this. But boy, it's an awful lot of stuff on this. So um, so with that said, going back to you, uh, Commissioner uh, Daly. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I understand what you say. This uh, resolution, the law department and I sat and I believe uh, the law, law director, Greg, I think it was Mr. Sturkey that went through this. He checked everything out. Anything that was not factual in the original resolution that came from uh, the surrounding counties that had been passed, it was vetted by our law department and things that were not could be justified or proven were taken out. So this is, like I say, all this is, is something. And let me say this, I agree with uh, Commissioner Buster totally. This COVID-19 has changed a lot. We gave away a lot of our rights. We just got an email. If you, you know, if you have read your email, we got an email from a lady that says the health department has got too much power. Where is she getting, where is Dr. Buchanan getting all this power from? And, you know, and for everyone, I'll let everyone know, I've asked the law department for a, ref <clears throat> to research and see what the health department, what powers the health department have. That's, that's a different story. And let's not talk about the health department. This is back. I just want to say in the law department, they want to confirm how many hours, they spent hours on vetting this resolution out. And so I feel very comfortable with the wording because our law department has vetted everything on this, this resolution. And it's non-binding resolution. Vote yes or vote no. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Daly. And uh, I'm looking out there, are there any other commissioners that wanna weigh in on this? I think uh, once again, the, yeah, we're not, technically voting on this tonight, the motion on the floor was uh, to send forward with no recommendation to actually vote on next week. Uh, any other commissioners have a, a question, a clarifier, or any other uh, follow-up on this? Um, seeing no other lights. Uh, Madam Clerk, would you uh, please call the roll for the vote? Commissioner Beeler? Aye. Commissioner Beeler, false aye. Commissioner Daly? Aye. Commissioner Daly, false aye. Commissioner J. Aye. Commissioner J. Bolts, aye. Commissioner Biggs? Aye. Commissioner Biggs, Bolts, aye. Commissioner Gill? No. Commissioner Gill, Bolts, no. Commissioner Carringer? Aye. Commissioner Carringer, Bolts, aye. Commissioner Smith? Yes. 
Commissioner Smith votes aye. Commissioner Nystrom? Aye. Commissioner Nystrom votes aye. Commissioner Schoonmaker? Aye. Commissioner Schoonmaker votes aye. Commissioner Anders? Aye. Is that aye? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Commissioner Anders votes aye. And Commissioner Bussler? Since I have the decide. Since I have the deciding vote, I vote aye. Commissioner Bussler votes aye. You have 10 aye and one no. Okay, thank you. All right, that passes. All right, so that will be moved forward for uh, the actual vote to uh, next week's uh, Board of Commissioners meeting. Uh, all right, Madam Clerk, next item. The next item is number 47. It's ordinance 0 20 4 101, amending the Knox County Code Appendix A zoning, Article 3, Section 3.50 off-street parking requirements to allow, to allow a parking study to be submitted and approved as a basis for reducing the minimum number of off-street parking spaces. This amends ordinance 0-90-9-130 adopted on September 10th, 1990 as amended. This is on second reading. Okay, the uh, proper motion on this would be to send forward no recommendation. So the reading will count next week. I'm looking to Commissioner Beeler for the motion. Motion to approve, Mr. Chairman. Okay, and is there Second. a Second. Okay, I'm seeing people shaking their heads. There's a motion to approve. It's, it should be motion to send without recommendation. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. stand corrected. I motion said. to approve, motion yeah. to send forward without recommendation. Yeah. Thank you. That's the motion. Second. Yeah. And this is the second reading, so we need to send it forward with no recommendation. So uh, to, to clarify that, the, Mr. Beeler has made a, a motion to send forward with no recommendation. And who's the uh, second? Commissioner Schoonmaker. Uh, that's on the floor. Uh, Commissioner Daly, your, your blue hand is still raised. I think that's from the last agenda item. Um, but I'll, uh, I'll clarify that. Okay. Commissioner Anders, you're, uh, you're on. All right. So you're light. Okay. So, uh, seeing no other discussion, uh, Madam, the, uh, motion is on the floor properly before us. Madam Clerk, would you do a roll call vote, please? Commissioner Daly. Aye. Did you say aye? Yes. Okay, Commissioner Daly votes aye. Commissioner J? Aye. Commissioner J votes aye. Commissioner Biggs? Aye. Commissioner Biggs votes aye. Commissioner Gill? Yes. Commissioner Gill votes aye. Commissioner Carringer? Aye. Commissioner Carringer votes aye. Commissioner Smith? Yes. Commissioner Smith votes aye. Commissioner Nystrom? Aye. Commissioner Nystrom votes aye. Commissioner Schoonmaker? Aye. Commissioner Schoonmaker votes aye. Commissioner Anders? Aye. Commissioner Anders votes aye. Commissioner Bussler? Aye. Commissioner Bussler votes aye. Commissioner Beeler? Excuse me, aye. Commissioner Beeler votes aye. All members present voting aye. Okay, uh, thank you. It passes. Uh, Madam Clerk, next item. The next item is number 48. Consideration of the acceptance of new county roads. A, B, C, and D are all in Hidden, Farm, Hidden View Farms subdivision, District W6. A is Yearling Road, Unit 1. B is Colt Haven Drive, Units 1 and 2. C is Silver Spur Lane, Unit 1. D is Golden Nugget Lane, Unit 2. And E, F, and G are all located in Penrose Terrace subdivision, District W6. E is Penro Penrose Terrace Lane, F is Feather Rose Lane, and G is Flowering Peach Lane. All right, thank you. Uh, can I get a motion, please? Motion to approve. Okay, we have a motion for approval. Commissioner Anders, is there a second? Second. Okay, second from Commissioner Smith. All right, that motion's properly before us. Madam Clerk, would you please uh, do a roll call vote? Kim? Sorry. Commissioner Jay? Commissioner Jay, I Jay. can't hear you. Aye. Commissioner Jay votes aye. Commissioner Biggs? Aye. Commissioner Biggs votes aye. Commissioner Gill? Yes. Commissioner Gill votes aye. Commissioner Carringer? Aye. Commissioner Carringer votes aye. Commissioner Smith? Yes. Commissioner Smith votes aye. Commissioner Nystrom? Aye. Commissioner Nystrom votes aye. Commissioner Schoonmaker? Aye. Commissioner Schoonmaker votes aye. Commissioner Anders? Aye. Commissioner Anders votes aye. Commissioner Bussler? Aye. Commissioner Bussler votes aye. Commissioner Beeler? Aye. 
Commissioner Beeler votes aye. Commissioner Daly. Aye. Commissioner Daly votes aye. All members present voting aye. All right, thank you. It passes. Okay, uh, Madam Clerk, next item. The next item is number 49, consideration of a closure of a portion of the right of way on Cadillac Drive, located at the corner of Cadillac Drive and DeVille Way, totaling 360 feet in length. At request of Catherine Fuller, this is on second reading. Move still without recommendation. Second. Okay, we have a proper motion from Commissioner Anders and the second, I believe, was that from Commissioner Smith? Um, or who, who was the second from? Biggs. Biggs, okay, sorry, uh, sorry, Commissioner Biggs. Uh, uh, the motion is to send forward with, uh, with no recommendation to be properly read next week. Madam Clerk. Commissioner Biggs. Aye. Commissioner Biggs votes aye. Commissioner Gill. Yes. Commissioner Gill votes aye. Commissioner Carringer. Aye. Commissioner Carringer votes aye. Commissioner Smith. Yes. Commissioner Smith votes aye. Commissioner Nystrom. Yeah, I, I, it's going to be I, but I also may want to research if there's a cross street called, um, I, I was looking for El Dorado Avenue to, to cross here, but I'm not sure if that's, um, I'll have to get on Google Maps, but I, I vote aye. Commissioner Nystrom votes aye. Commissioner Schoonmaker? Aye. Commissioner Schoonmaker votes aye. Commissioner Anders? Aye. Commissioner Anders votes aye. Commissioner Bussler? Aye. Commissioner Bussler votes aye. Commissioner Beeler? Aye. Commissioner Beeler votes aye. Commissioner Daly? Aye. Commissioner Daly votes aye. Commissioner J. Aye. Commissioner J votes aye. All members present voting aye. All right. Thank you. All right. Madam Clerk, next item. Item 50, line item transfers. Motion to approve. Uh, wait, we want to move forward, but no recommendation. Excuse right. me. Yeah. 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 Motion, excuse me. Forward. Getting late. I know. Who was the second on that? Thank you. Beeler. Thank you, Commissioner Beeler. So it was uh, the motion to send forward no recommendation was Commissioner uh, Schoonmaker with the second from Commissioner Beeler. Uh, Madam Clerk. Commissioner Gill. Commissioner Gill. Yes. Okay, Commissioner Gill votes aye. Commissioner Carringer. Aye. Commissioner Carringer votes aye. Commissioner Smith. Yes. Commissioner Smith votes aye. Commissioner Nystrom. Aye. Commissioner Nystrom votes aye. Commissioner Schoonmaker. Aye. Commissioner Schoonmaker votes aye. Commissioner Anders. Aye. Commissioner Anders votes aye. Commissioner Bussler. Aye. Commissioner Bussler votes aye. Commissioner Beeler. Aye. Commissioner Beeler votes aye. Commissioner Daly. Aye. Commissioner Daly votes aye. Commissioner J. Aye. Commissioner J votes aye. Commissioner Biggs. Aye. Commissioner Biggs votes aye. All members present voting aye. All right, thank you. It passes. All right. Madam Clerk, next item. Item number 51 is a spread of record for travel for Commissioners Gill, Carringer, Nystrom, Schoonmaker, Anders, Bustler, Daly, and Biggs. Thank you. Item number 52 is a presentation of a proclamation by the Knox County Mayor proclaiming April 2020 as Fair Housing Month in Knox County. Uh, I might ask the, uh, the the mayor's office to weigh in on this one. We've kind of carried it forward and I just don't know if that's something that we want to move forward and you know have an opportunity to recognize and thanks to those folks maybe in June or July. Um, I know we've been kind of tagging this one along uh, for a while so uh, before we have any motion on this one, I'm, I'm going to look to the uh, to the sponsor, to the uh, the mayor's office, and or uh, uh, someone from community development. So uh, either Mayor Jacobs or uh, uh, Mr. Hare, if one of y'all wanted to, to weigh in on this. Hey, Chairman, it's Brian Hare. I'd like to defer to community development on this. Of course, we still want to move forward with it if it's their wish, just to simply acknowledge the work that's been done. So I'll defer to community development. Okay. Is Dwight here, or is he still at home convalescing? Um, both, Mr. Both, Mr. Uh, Chairman, I am here and home convalescing. So, yeah. okay. um, thank you very much. Um, we um, actually would ask that if uh, it's the will of the body to go ahead and um, affirm the resolution, because it is part of um, a series of things that we do that we report to HUD as steps towards affirmatively furthering fair housing. Um, we will have obviously a contract coming up uh, for annual action plan um, in the next uh, couple months and there might be a chance to um, recognize some of the agencies that support this work during the course of the year. 
but if commission was comfortable going ahead and approving the resolution, uh, we would appreciate it. And we'll, we'll make certain that that's contained in our, um, uh, what's called a CAPER, our comprehensive annual performance evaluation and review that we submit to HUD. So moved. Okay, so we have a motion for approval from uh, Commissioner Gill. And is there a, uh, you know, as chair, I'd like to make a, uh, I believe in what we're doing here. So I will be the second on Commissioner Gill's motion. Uh, so Madam Clerk, would you please uh, call roll on this one? Starting with Com Commissioner Carringer. Aye. Commissioner Carringer votes aye. Commissioner Smith? Yes. Commissioner Smith votes aye. Commissioner Nystrom? Aye. Commissioner Nystrom votes aye. Commissioner Schoonmaker? Aye. Commissioner Schoonmaker votes aye. Commissioner Anders? Aye. Commissioner Anders votes aye. Commissioner Bussler? Aye. Commissioner Bussler votes aye. Commissioner Beeler? Aye. Commissioner Beeler votes aye. Commissioner Daly? Aye. Commissioner Daly votes aye. Commissioner J? Aye. Commissioner J votes aye. Commissioner Biggs? Aye. Commissioner Biggs votes aye. Commissioner Gill? Yes. Commissioner Gill votes aye. All members voting aye. All right, thank you. Uh, good work, Dwight. Uh, two months, uh, and I, I wanna harken back uh, to the presentation y'all gave last month again too, that was, that was really informative. So uh, thank you for the work that your team is doing to help us with affordable housing here in uh, Knox County. Thank uh, you, Chairman. Clerk, next item. The next item is number 53, discussion and update on the Knox County budget vote. I, uh, thank you, everyone. I, I'm the one who put this on here. And as we heard uh, earlier in the evening, uh, I believe uh, Mr. Harry stated that the uh, that the mayor was going to be making his uh, budget presentation on June 1st, which is the, I guess, the last possible day that uh, by our charter he can he can do that. Uh, you know, my initial plan, I'm just going to throw this out here, kind of my, my initial plan, and then we can talk about this and uh, see how we want to do it. But you know, there's so many moving parts in trying to forecast uh, state revenues and local revenues that the uh, the prudent thing seemed to be to wait until the, uh, the last possible minute to do our our budget vote so that it'll be the most succinct and uh, you know the, the, the most accurate uh, based on the information that we uh, that we have. So uh, just to, it kind of states some obvious when we look at June. You know, June is a one, two, three, four. Uh, it's a five Monday month. Uh, so we've already got our work session scheduled for the 15th and our uh, board of commissioners meeting is gonna be coming up on the uh, 22nd. And the mayor is planning on making his budget presentation to us and the community on the first. Uh, so, you know, my initial thoughts on this were, you know, that could allow the mayor to make his budget presentation to us. And when he's presenting to us, ultimately he's really presenting it to the whole community. And then that would give us as a body two specific meetings to uh, discuss and deliberate on that with our both of our the work session and our regular board of commissioners meeting with the possibility for a uh, budget vote that Monday the 29th. So uh, that was my uh, initial thoughts on this. And I think uh, based and Grant, I think I spoke with the mayor's office uh, about this potential schedule a few months ago. But I, I would guess that they're probably still comfortable with the budget vote, maybe on the 29th. But wanted to kind of uh, go to you guys and see uh, your take if you think we need to add in some extra you know, public meetings, just to kind of get that ball rolling right now so we can get that schedule set in, um, in June. So, uh, Commissioner Anders? Yes, sir. I think it's. Uh, I think we have to have a public meeting anyway. Wouldn't it be after the work session be appropriate for that? Um, and I mean, 29th is awful close. I mean, we got to talk about the ramifications if it doesn't get passed. I mean, I think it will. I mean, he's he's opened himself office up to us twice uh, uh, for meetings, and I think we'll, we'll we'll probably have a few questions because we know there's the revenue issue. But um, we'll have to make sure we schedule that public meeting. I believe probably on our work session. Probably on the 15th. Okay. Um, Commissioner Anders, any other follow up on that? Okay. Uh, Commissioner Schoonmaker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think that's a great uh, idea to have it on uh, Monday, uh, June 29th. Uh, has the mayor's office decided what time they're going to do the budget presentation on June the 1st? That's uh, uh, Mr. Mayor, if you guys and uh, uh, Mayor Jacobs, Brian, if you guys would like to weigh in on this, kind of let us uh, and for, give us some feedback in terms of this timeline, if, if that also, if, if we're all on the same page right now. 
Uh, we'll announce next week, we'll probably be first thing in the morning, uh, and uh, we'll, of course, do it uh, via video. So, but uh, we'll make a formal announcement next week on that. Okay, likely in the morning on the first. Yes, yes, as, soon, as early as possible, of course. Okay. So, uh, Drusilla, uh, you heard what uh, Commissioner Anders said. Uh, can you get in the uh, pipeline the uh, the process to get a, a uh, you know a public hearing on the budget to take place uh, probably at seven or immediately following the county work session on the fifteenth? I will take care of it. I will get with Sunny and PBA and get that scheduled. Okay. Uh, Anybody else you know, who, who uh, wants to weigh in on this one? I mean, I think that seems pretty reasonable. I know that uh, Chris has been pretty accessible uh, as we're all trying to figure out this forecast and uh, we'll probably be talking about different numbers in three weeks than you know, our, our current forecast right now. So, um, you know, unless I hear otherwise, uh, you know, obviously if we have to make a tweak or change, we can do that through the forum, but that's kind of the, the, the timeline that we'll roll with knowing that we'll have uh, you know, two good meetings in, in June that we can dedicate a lot of time to this. So, and uh, if need be, we can, we can, you know, hopefully if you think we need more after you've had a chance maybe to meet with the mayor or Chris, then we can, uh, we can try to set up some, another uh, budget hearing, but I would like to think that that's, uh, that should be enough time. So anyhow, so that's the plan. All right, Madam Clerk, uh, next item. The next item is, see number 54 was deferred, number 55, discussion item regarding the hospital guideline during COVID-19 pandemic. I think as I we said- moved that to the front. Well, we moved that to the front and uh, I think we clarified that with uh, Commissioner Buster earlier. So uh, okay. Commissioner Buster, you're, you're good with that, so. Yes, I thought, I thought we mentioned that a while ago. Yeah, yeah we, we did, I know, okay. we did. So, Sorry. All right. Next one. So item question. 56, discussion item regarding new regulations for stormwater detention ponds and testing water for contamination. Okay. I know, uh, I think the quote Commissioner Daly from earlier in the meeting, he didn't want to steal Charlie's thunder on this particular item since we talked about it, I think on item 43. Um, but I'll go ahead and uh, recognize Commissioner Biggs on this. I will, this is actually pertaining to previously. Um, I was just wondering from my own, have we ever seen when uh, cable TV is going to meet again off the last month's discussion of yeah. TBS and things of that nature? I was just wondering if maybe- you know, I, I, I know I saw, uh, just speaking freehand, I know I saw some emails from like the new per go-to person for one of the providers here. I, I, I'm not on that committee, but I don't know if they're, char I'm not sure if, if y'all wanna, you know, if anybody from the cable committee wanna kind of provide an update on where we're going. It, it, yeah, there was some good motion movement coming out of that uh, from our last meeting and based on the emails that I saw. Yeah, if I may, Mr. Chairman, uh, we I mean, since the cable TV committee consists of the entire commission, uh, Commissioner Jay, who's the vice chair, and I uh, felt that it was best to, to have the meeting on a regular meeting day rather than bring the whole commission together on a different day. Uh, and the first available was the July work session. Uh, which is July 18th. And so the plan is for the cable TV committee to meet on the afternoon of July, I'm sorry, July 20th, uh, which is the uh, work session date for July. And we will uh, convene the cable TV committee at either three or 3.30 uh, on that uh, Monday. Okay, have you guys worked it all out with your SILA too? We have, right. we have uh, right now, the only room available is the commission conference room because the plan is for the courts to, um, I believe, use the main assembly room uh, through a certain date. Yep, that's true. But we're playing that by ear because if the small assembly were to open up, that might be a better location than the commission conference room. But for now, that facility, it has been secured uh, for the meeting if we need it. And okay. uh, Commissioner Wheeler, I think we discussed 3 p.m. because this is the first we time did. this has met in some time and it um, we felt like it, we were gonna have presentations and meet the time. So yes, uh, I think we said three. We did. Yes, thank you. We have already reached out to Comcast. They will have a, a representative there, and we intend to reach out to the other uh, cable and internet providers as well. Good deal. All right. That's a, I'm really glad to see that moving forward. It's one of those committees that you know you, you get on, and when you first get on commission, and then you wonder what what's going to happen here. You know, 
So that's, I'm glad to see that. So, uh, all right, that, uh, and Commissioner Biggs, you brought that up, but I wanna go back to, we were transitioning into discussion item 56, which was a uh, follow-up around regulations for stormwater detention ponds and testing water from contamination that was brought by Commissioner Busters. And once again, I know uh, Commissioner Deli, we had talked about that a little earlier in the meeting on one particular uh, uh, engineering item, but I wanted to make sure that we uh, gave this its fair share if there's any additional clarification for Mr. Stoden or any additional questions that may have popped up since we talked about that earlier. Uh, go ahead, and I'm gonna pass it to Commissioner Bussler. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The reason why I brought this on here was that there are some issues going on at the state level that detention ponds are not going to be handled through the, uh, uh, the POAs or HOAs or things like this. It's gonna drop right into the stormwater drainage. Now, it's already happening in other counties. Now, it's going to cost us money to go and oversee all these detention ponds that we have that we need to be taking care of. We had an issue not too long ago that there was a sewer line broke and they pumped raw sewage into a detention pond that flowed into a stream that flowed into Beaver Creek. They went back to test it and one part of the pond was at the level of the E. coli and the other was way above that. But they said because one end was not right, it made that one subdivision have some issues because kids played in that detention pond with that after that raw sewage was in there. Now, that's some of the issues that are coming up. That's gonna fall back on Jim Snowden and his group to look at these detention ponds when they fill up and we take care of them. And it's gonna be a budgeting issue. And that's what I wanted to bring up. Those are some things that are on the line at the state level that says the individuals are not responsible for that. That will be the counties because they're in charge of stormwater drainage. And that's all I wanted to mention about that. Thank you for giving me an opportunity to mention those things that we're gonna to have to budget for. All right, thank you. Uh, I see Commissioner Biggs and then Commissioner Daly, uh, uh, if y'all wanna weigh in on this one. And then we may wanna also circle back to Jim Stoden to see if he's uh, included that in some of his future budgets, but go ahead, Commissioner Biggs. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, my question was actually to Commissioner Bustler. Is there uh, any way I could get a copy of that specific case? That's just concerning considering everything that Justin Bailey's done with the flotilla. And I, I'm not 100% sure, but I think I am. I think Commissioner Jay even kayaked that Beaver Creek and helped clean it up. Uh, Many times. Yeah. I can't, well, the situation only happened about a month and a half or so ago. I called uh, Jim Snowden on it. We went out there. They took took a look at but there was raw sewage, a quite a bit amount pumped into that detention pond. And later it was rained and then it was released out through the detention pond itself. They had originally covered it up. Uh, the uh, drainage pipe that went across the road that finally fed it down into Beaver Creek. But uh, we did have uh, Hallsdale Powell to come out and check it a couple of times, but there was a, a larger amount than what they wanted to let you know uh, that went out there. And what I'm saying in the future, we're going to, the county's going to be responsible for those things. So it's already been taken care of. They, they've uh, done their uh, shake and bake of whatever they want to do out there to tell you that it's all right, but it's not all right when you pump raw sewage out into a detention pond. So, but right. if you're worried about it, we've all, Jim Stone has already been looking into it. Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, uh, Commissioner Biggs, you got a uh, follow up or you good? I, I'm good. I, I would, I was just, you know, a concerned citizen that would send an email in like that, I'd like to have just seen it and maybe seen what area it was in because that's that's concerning knowing the amount of work we've put into the PAL area down there, the flotilla and stuff, but that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Bustle. I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. Commissioner Jay. Um, did, if I could. Oh, excuse if me. I think no, Commissioner no. Uh, Daly, I think, weighed in earlier. So I'm sorry, okay. uh, Carson, your light turned on a little sooner. Sorry, Commissioner Jay. Mm -hmm. All right. All right, Carson's waving it off. So back to you, Commissioner Jay. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, just, just seeing if uh, 
Director Snowden is still on the thing. If you could explain just, I think at the beginning of the discussion early on in the meeting, it was uh, uh, trying to understand the process of who owns the ponds after we certify it and who maintains them. And then if you could also talk about what kind of enforcement um, mechanisms are in place if somebody violates or if the, you know, something like this happens sewage wise and whatever. But if you could talk about who owns and maintains the ponds after we certify them, are they the property, are they the portion of Box County if they're only if they're in the right of way or are they at the HOA and then what are the inspection processes and, and violation or uh, enforcement processes? Sure, Commissioner. Um, we require that detention ponds or, or we strongly encourage detention ponds to be within a drainage easement. Uh, oftentimes on older subdivisions, you'll see them on individual lots and that's a pretty large burden to be putting on one landowner. Uh, so we strongly encourage uh, folks and most, most, most folks do in, uh, place them on a common area uh, to where the HOA has to, to maintain them per the maintenance agreements that you guys approve routinely each month. Um, our stormwater ordinance codifies uh, the, uh, the, the maintenance responsibilities, uh, they are deferred to the HOA. What Commissioner Bussler is referring to is some litigation that is still pending at the state level uh, regarding the uh, NPPS um, general permit. Uh, once we still are a little bit unsure on how that permit will affect what uh, we call permanent stormwater management. There are six minimum control measures that we have to comply with, one of which is uh, permanent stormwater management, uh, which is, is, is detention ponds and devices that treat uh, both the quantity and the quality of the water leaving that development. Uh, so once that rule is complete, we'll have a little better idea about it but it is our anticipation that those things will still be the responsibility of the landowners. Uh, and then if they choose not to, uh, you know, follow through with those requirements, our ordinance gives us the ability to go upon that property, do that work and actually uh, bill or put a place a lien on their property uh, to recoup the county tax dollars that were expent to uh, comply with the ordinance. Thank you. All right, thank you, Commissioner Jay. Uh, back to you, Commissioner Daly. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, thank you, uh, Jim Snowden. One of our, uh, I tell people and I brag on two people or two departments for sure in Norris County, and that is our roads and solid waste departments and our parks department. I think they do more with less than anybody that I've ever seen. And the quality of the work coming out there, and I have no doubt that. Uh, you know, the stormwater aspect. The reason I asked that question, and, uh, and Charlie, I'm glad he brought it up. There is a development that's going on in, in the ninth district that the detention pond is starting to get a third full from the runoff and the developers doing everything correctly, I do believe. But as much rain that we've had, we've got mud flowing into the detention pond, rising the level and now we're gonna have, we have much rain, we're gonna have that same flooding problem across the road into the neighbor's yard. So that's the reason I brought it up. And uh, I guess my question, final question to Jim is, besides thank you, is that, uh, do we have anybody that's dear, say a development's been shut down for three months, six months to a year. Do we have anybody to go out and check the flow or is that just when a citizen says, hey, we got a flooding problem. Can you come and look at it? Thank you. Uh, yes, Commissioner Daly. Uh, we actually, uh, required by our MPDS permit, uh, we're required to do 30-day uh, or monthly inspections on all open uh, grading sites. So if you've got a grading permit in Knox County and you're disturbing earth, uh, we have a uh, inspector that's there checking all those erosion control measures uh, for compliance, uh, adequacy, things like that. Uh, within within 30 days. So we, we should be catching that. And if you don't care to share that location with me, I'll be more than happy to give it an extra set of uh, closer examination. All right, good uh, follow up. Now I've got uh, Commissioner Schoonmaker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, 
I was trying to follow Commissioner Bustler's story. So it, am I to assume that Hallsdale Powell Utility District employees were pumping sewage into a residential um, basin? Is that is that what I am heard you to say? Or, or, or who actually did all this? Yes, it did happen. Uh, they had a pipe that had been a sewage pipe that had been leaking for uh, some time and it caused a sinkhole. To get to the pipe, they had to pump the, that sewage out. And when they pumped it out, it went into the storm water drainage in that subdivision, which, which goes into the detention pond. We were out there, we took a look at it and we, I was upset with it. And when it does rain, and you go back out there, there is a green kind of ooze it's on top of the water but they say it's all right they say they've been out there and they've tested it a number of times and and uh, there is a supposedly a level that you can have that in the that detention pond you're going to have e coli in it anyway because of waste from animals that gets into it but when you have the human raw sewage that they pumped out to get to the sewage pipe to fix it now that's a different story so, but that's been taken care of and I'm watching it every day to make sure that it doesn't get any worse than what it was. Uh, but again, we're gonna be responsible for those uh, detention ponds that's been there for numbers of years that have filled up, backflowed and everything else with if this um, kind of legislation passes because the individual that owns that should not have the burden for the rest of the uh, subdivision or the development he's in to take care of that. And a lot of that is on the property owner's uh, land that goes ahead and gives it to the person that's closest to that detention pond. And that's the kind of legislation that's down in Nashville. So again, uh, they'll probably require us to take a look at more of those that we don't have that kind of um, situation yeah. arise again. Okay. Well, and then my follow-up question is to Mr. Snowden. It does, was the state of Tennessee aware of this and, and did they sign off on doing something of that kind of procedure? Um, yes, Commissioner. We, uh, Hallsdale Powell actually is required by permit, their permit to self-report that uh, sanitary sewer overflow. Uh, and we also reported it to TDEC. So yeah, it was dual reported uh, by both folks, and, and it was my understanding that what Hallsdale did, they plugged the detention basin to where water wouldn't flow out uh, because they the sewer was leaking and they had to repair it, and the, the safest place to play, put it was in the detention pond, but they plugged the pond uh, so that no water or sewage would get out, cleaned it up, and then reopened the pond was, was my understanding. So, uh, they did try to do, I guess, a due diligence effort to try to minimize, uh, you know, downstream uh, impact. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, all right, thank you. I'm gonna, not an effort to beat a dead horse on this one, but you know, there, there may be folks who are tuning in who don't, you know, we've got retention ponds, you've got construction site ponds. Jim, just for all of us who maybe aren't out with the, you know, out with developers or, or whatnot, you know, sometimes I've commonly had, since we're on this subject, before we wrap up, you often have questions about now, you know, when we're when a construction site is under construction, is it plugged? Is it ready to drain? You know, is it more of a construction site retention pond versus something long term that is allowed to drain? Could you just kind of clarify how how that all how those di different types of uh, basins are set up, whether they've got a plug in them, where they don't, where they're allowed to drain freely, just for the, just a refresher for all of us and anybody who may be tuning in. Sure, Commissioner. Yeah, it, it gets confusing and sometimes I get confused myself. Uh, de detention ponds, we're detaining water and that's the permanent condition typically. Uh, that pond holds it and releases it. A retention pond holds it indefinitely. It never leaves the site. It has to infiltrate. Uh, and, and that is what occurs on a construction site. TDEC requires us to keep ponds plugged until the entire, or well, 70% uniform stabilization. So that's why during a subdivision, as homes are being built, 
we keep the pond plugged in the bottom. So essentially, the only way water gets out is when you have that large storm and it surcharges into the overflow structure. Uh, so that construction pond is kind of acting like a retention pond because it is, it is not releasing water slowly. Uh, and then once 70% stabilization of all the lots get completed, then we convert the pond over into a detention pond and that forward it releases water slowly downstream. It's an intended design. So it's a little confusing, uh, but, and hopefully I've uh, done some, uh, sh shed some light on that. Retention evolving to detention. So uh, that's, I just thought for those who are tuning in, that would be clear, good, good information that since we went down that path. Um, Madam Clark, are there uh, any other items on our agenda? I believe we did add, I don't know if it even had it. No, that went on uh, consent, but Madam Clark, what's our next item? Uh, that takes care of everything on the agenda. Okay, uh, uh, matters. I'll open it up for any uh, announcements. Uh, Commissioner Schoonmaker and uh, Daly, I see you've got your hands raised. Yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, what is the procedure if a citizen sends in an email for public forum? Is the commission office supposed to read those into the record? We had at the opening of the meeting, we had a place for public forum. And now at the end of the agenda, we have a place for public forum. But did we not have any response be, on public uh, forum? We should get them all. And then I would think that uh, as long as uh, Trusilla is communicating with the clerk's office, they should be recorded as part of the meeting minutes. At least that's my intent on them. So um, if that's not happening, then uh, we need to make sure that it all, all the, like for example, emails, we got about some of the things tonight that should all be uh, registered as part of our, our meeting minutes. At least that's my, uh, my take on it, Commissioner Schoonmaker. Okay. And as with land use things, you know, we've, we've done our best to give uh, people a chance to weigh in on the land issues, things that we, as we've done at zoning uh, the last meeting when we caught up on all those zoning issues. Uh, Commissioner Daly. Yeah, that brings me a good lead in, Commissioner Schoonmaker. Uh, law department, do you have anything to weigh in? Make sure we've done everything correctly on John's question. All department. Mr. Law Director, are you there? I guess move on. Yes, Chairman, I'm having yeah. trouble uh, technologically. And you asked me, Commissioner? Uh, have we dotted our I's and crossed our T's? And uh, did you hear John's question? Yes, about the public forum, uh, and I heard the chairman's response, and if they're included in the meeting minutes, then they were public record and available for everyone to read. Uh, we didn't establish anything beyond that in terms of your rules, so uh, under this COVID-19 and under the electronic, <clears throat> they, we've had two different public forum methods and one is like, uh, especially at the land use issues, the people come online and uh, I think they have a, one of them had a selected group that spoke for, or a selected person that spoke for a group. And then we had <clears throat> some developers that spoke during, you know, our zoning issues. And the public has been able to participate. Uh, I would check and make sure, and I think the chairman said that he was going to, is the only reason I didn't comment one way or the other to make sure that they were included in the minutes as part of the public forum. Uh, it'd be a policy issue whether you just want them read into the record or not because they're, uh, you all are including them in the record by reference. So either way they're in the record, but it, it's up to you all how you want to do it. All right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Law Director for that clarification. Uh, Commissioner Biggs. Yes, Mr. Chairman, I had actually a uh, question for Commissioner Beeler. Um, this weekend, especially in the end of last week, and also Commissioner Jay, I don't, I don't know if I'm sure you have as well. I've gotten an abnormally large amount of emails about a proposed development coming to the Edwards Place subdivision. I didn't know if we were going to uh, 
take the opportunity. I remember all three of us went to a church. I feel like it was about a year ago uh, mm -hmm. and talked about a development that was coming up. I didn't know if we were going to speak with that um, neighborhood or the people in that area over uh, maybe sun shining something, but I, I browsed through the zoning portion and didn't see anything. I just want to know if you could maybe update us. Well, I, I'll update you a little bit. I have asked the uh, Northeast Knox planning group uh, if they would put together and let us know about a meeting and give us ample time to sunshine it. We'd be glad to be there. Uh, you know, I will tell you that uh, there is no sector plan change or zoning change being requested. Uh, this property is already zoned for what this developer wants to do. So this decision lies with the planning commission. So uh, just to follow up on that, it, it looked at first glance, is that more of a use on review type of uh, is. issue that we've been copied on when it's not gonna be coming before this body? That is correct. And sometimes, you know, residents don't know, you know, the full extent of how the mechanisms work. And so obviously the first thing they do is, is contact their county commissioner. And I've encouraged them to, uh, to email the planning commission and to copy the commission on them as well. And, uh, so yeah, this is this really going to be a planning commission issue, and uh, but I, I think as commissioners, uh, if they wanted to meet with us, we'd be more than happy to do that. Yeah, I would echo that. If we're if there's somebody who would like to meet and there's an invitation, then I'll accept it. Okay, very good. I, Commissioner Biggs, are you good? Yes, sir. I appreciate that, Chairman. I just wanted to you know just kind of make sure that they felt like they had our ear. Um, on this on this um, issue out there, I know we all three kind of teamed together once before on something like this and sunshined it. So I just didn't know exactly where we were at in the process. But thank you to both of them. And thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, uh, Commissioner Carringer. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Actually, I wanted to ask Commissioner Anders uh, if if and when we've thought about maybe doing any more about charter review. And I'll let him answer. And then I just also want to wish everybody a happy and safe Memorial Day weekend. Yeah, so we, uh, I've talked to the election commission and we talked, I've talked to the law department a little bit about, um, you know, what it would take to get that back together. I don't think it would be conducive to try to bring that large of a group onto a Zoom meeting and try to change the charter without the public there. I think that's, uh, I think that's asking too much when uh, there's other things that we probably could do. And I don't, I don't think that, I think if you're going to change the charter, the public ought to be in the room uh, or have the opportunity to be in the room. So we're going to set up some meetings in anticipation of opening, opening up for the June. Uh, we've got to, to get it uh, August the 17th, I believe, into business day, August 17th, I think, to get it on the November ballot. And so I think we can have two or three meetings, uh, three or four meetings to get that done. It will be quick. Uh, it may be a Saturday, uh, but we're going to try to set some of those things up. Cool. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Carringer. Uh, any other announcements or anything? All right. Uh, I'll have a uh, probably don't need, we don't need to vote on this. Is there a motion for adjournment? All right. From Commissioner Daly and everybody else is smiling. So. Uh, this meeting is adjourned. Oh, hello, there's a kitty. Uh, oh, how awesome, yeah. <laughs> uh, Mr. Chairman, point of order, do we not have the public hearing meeting immediately after? Uh, yes, we do. I'm about to close this one, and then I think we've got it set up as a, uh, as a, as a uh, secondary Zoom. So uh, I'll look through the IT department, and uh, is that uh, to confirm, is this public hearing gonna be a separate Zoom meeting? That is accurate. All right, okay, we will uh, close. I'll see you guys on the next meeting, but I'll go ahead and close this meeting out. Thank you. <laughs>